The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Good morning uh, to everyone who is uh, following these uh, proceedings at Public Hearing 16. Uh, I commence by inviting Commissioner Mason to uh, make the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> we acknowledge the First Nations people as the original inhabitants of the lands on which this hearing is sitting. Nganenga Jokururunku, Kalyoni, Arnago Kuariba, Chara Ninanja Joda, Ngora, Nanyanka, we recognise Mejin, Brisbane, Nganenga Ngorokanta Nanyi, Ngora, Mejin, Brisbane Ta. We recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both the Chiribal and Jagera nations. Nganenga, Murukanta, Nanyi, Karo, Panya, Brisbane, Rivenya, Alinjara, Muno, Upa, Rira, Arongo, Mura, Richa, Joda, Ninantya, Muno, Kwari, Ninanyi, Churubunga, Muno, Jagarana. And we pay respect to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Their land is where the city of Sydney is now located. We also pay respect to the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation, where the city of Melbourne is now located. We pay deep respects to all elders past, present and future, and especially elders, parents, young people and children with disability. Um, I'd now like to read the First Nations content warning. This hearing will include evidence that may bring about different responses for people. It will include accounts of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of First Nations children with disability and their experiences with child protection systems across Australia. First Nations viewers, please note that the evidence may describe trauma, including removal and if the evidence raises concerns for you, please contact the National Counselling and Referral Service on 1800 421 468. You can also contact Lifeline 13 11 14, Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636 or your local Aboriginal medical services for social and emotional wellbeing support. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Mason. Uh, yes, Mr Crowley. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners, this morning okay. our first witness will be Dr Kelly Thompson, the Acting Director at the Cath French Secure Care Centre in Western Australia. Dr Thompson will provide evidence in relation to her role supervising the Cath French Centre and also research in relation to secure care practice and outcomes and models. Commissioners, a copy of the statement of Dr Thompson is in Tender Bundle Part C at tab 51. I tender that statement and ask to be marked 16.23 as an exhibit, please. Yes, that can be done. Thank you. There are two further documents which are additional to the statement of Dr. Thompson, which are also in Tender Bundle Part C. Those are at tabs 52 and 53. And I ask that they also be uh, admitted and be marked as Exhibit 16.23.1 and 16.23.2, please. Yes, those uh, additional two documents uh, can be admitted into evidence with the markings uh, you have indicated, Mr. Crowley. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Should uh, now uh, Dr Thompson be affirmed? Yes, thank you, Chair. Dr Thompson, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. We appreciate your attendance and also the uh, written statements that you have provided. Um, if you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate, he will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. 
Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson. Now Mr. Crowley will ask you some questions. <clears throat> I should indicate uh, before we start uh, the location of uh, everyone, or nearly everyone, participating in this hearing. Uh, Commissioner Gelbley is participating from Melbourne. Uh, and Commissioner Mason is in our Brisbane hearing room. I am in the Sydney hearing room of the Royal Commission. Mr Crowley is in the same Brisbane hearing room as Commissioner Mason. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so, uh, Dr Thompson, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I can. Uh, I just wanted to start off, please, if you could just confirm for us your current position. Is that Acting Director at the Cath French Secure Care Centre? That's my current position, yes. And you are employed there in that role by the Department of Communities, Western Australia? I'm employed currently in that role, although my substantive position is as the Senior Psychologist in the yes. Secure Care Centre, yes. But Department of Communities is your employer? That's correct. Uh, and as for your substantive role, um, <clears throat> senior clinical psychologist, you have, I take it, for a number of years been um, practising within the department as a psychologist? That's correct. I've been at Secure Care for approximately five years and I was working in the department for another two years in a psychology role. And you have a number of qualifications. If you could just list those for us, please. So I currently hold a doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Western Australia, and that is the uh, highest qualification that I hold. I also have um, an honours degree in a Bachelor of Science. And amongst other things, Dr Thompson, in 2018, uh, you were awarded a Churchill Fellowship, which enabled you to conduct some international research uh, in respect of the field of secure care. Yes, that's correct. And following that research, you published a report uh, titled Creating a Secure Foundation for Children at Risk in late 2019. Yes, that's correct. Uh, do you have a copy of the report there with you? I do have a copy uh, of the report. Uh, 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 I will, um, perhaps at stages, bring it up on the screen. Dr. Thompson, so that we can follow all follow your evidence. Um, but, Commissioners, that report, which will in due course be tendered, it's at tab 100 of the annexure uh, of um, the tender bundle C. Uh, Dr. Thompson, can I ask you, please, if we could perhaps go to the report? Uh, and I'll see if we can bring it up on the screen. Can we bring up that document, please? It's DRC.9999.0062. Thank you. And I think we have it up now on the screen. I can't tell. No. Can we just go, please, to... I'll give the reference again. It's... It's hard me. It's DRC.9999.0062.0061. Yes, that's right, Chair. Your report is proving elusive, Dr. Thompson. Here we go. Yes, there it is. Thank you. Um, Dr. Thompson, could we start, please, uh, if we could just go to page 36 of the report using the numbering at the bottom of the page. Um, 
I'm interested to ask you about, um, first of all, the, the model and uh, the purpose of uh, models of secure care. Now, the, we heard yesterday um, from Ms Calders, who I think described the Cath French um, Centre as in part a therapeutic care service, um, but she gave some evidence to draw a distinction between what we might commonly understand as therapy on the one hand, as opposed to a therapeutic care service. Um, could I just ask you if you could tell us what, what the difference is between those in terms of um, what happens at the Cath French facility? Well, may I first acknowledge the traditional inhabitants of the land on which we're meeting from here today, the land on which I live and work, which is that of the Wajak Nuha people, and pay my respects to their elders and all those present for the contributions they make to the life of our country. With regards to your question is the distinction between therapy and therapeutic care. I think that it's important to note that therapeutic care is something that can be a part of any model of secure care. It's about being trauma-informed. It's about providing an individualised response to a child's needs and that the entire centre is established in a way that responds to those needs in line with best practice. When we're talking about therapy, we're talking about something I think that most people would more traditionally see as sitting in a psychologist's office with one person conducting something that is between those two people or perhaps a group therapy. It's a much more formal space. And I think that that's what sometimes people can assume is happening when we're talking about therapeutic care, which would be a misunderstanding. Therapeutic yes. care is about a 24-7 approach in everything that we do in response to a child and their needs. Yes, thank you, Dr. Thompson. So if we just go then to page 36 of your report, um, in this section of the report you've referred to and examined different purposes for um, secure care. So uh, I take it we're, what we're looking at here in your report is what the rationale or what the um, intended goal is for different types of secure care settings. Yes. So throughout my research and the centres that I visited, it appeared that there were four primary categories that we could class each service into in relation to purpose. So the first was a justice service. And so there were a number of places that I visited where children were being held in a secure care environment um, as opposed to being held in a traditional detention service and that the purpose was to provide rehabilitation and reintegration in response to children who presented with criminal behaviours. The other three purposes that were identified was a treatment service there were a very small number of services where they were providing that more traditional psychotherapy or therapy approach in those instances. There was the other two services. One was assessment, so where children were entering a secure care environment for the purposes of obtaining a comprehensive multidisciplinary assessment with the hope then that decisions could be made as to whether that child would go on to another secure care environment or if they could be back in the community following that period of assessment. And the last and most common purpose that was outlined was intervention. And so this is something that is slightly more difficult to define. Intervention meaning essentially that we are taking action to become involved in a situation that has become risky for that child with the purposes of containing that risk. And so this is the most common category for secure care services to fall under, and it would also be the category in which the CAF French Secure Care Centre would fall under. Yes, thank you. Now, if we look at the page that we have up of your report, page 36, under um, the heading of intervention, you've made that point that that is the CAF French Secure Care Centre is within that um, type of um, purpose category of intervention um, and you've cited from the policy um, from the Department of Communities policy about uh, what Cath French's purpose actually is to identify it as being that type of service. If we go over to page 37 
In the second paragraph there, the one that commences with given that intervention and its outcomes is a vaguer concept, it begs the question, how long does a therapeutic intervention take? Um, and you go on to say secure care can be considered a time and it's a circuit breaker to stabilise behaviour. Uh, and then the paragraph continues. It's correct, isn't it, that Kath French operates in that way, in short, as a circuit breaker? Yes, that's correct. That's what our policy outlines as being its current purpose. And in terms of stabilising, do we understand that to mean that when the child who's coming into the centre meets the relevant criteria for um, admission, the, the primary goal is to um, stabilise, to stop whatever behaviours are presenting that led to them coming into the centre? That's correct. So the aim is to intervene, providing a circuit breaker to stop the behaviour of risk that we've been seeing in the community. Now, given Mr the Crowley, can I, can I just uh, clarify, just to make sure we're all on, the, we're all on common yes. ground? Um, you're asking Dr Thompson about the position now at the centre, although her report is written in 2018. So I just want to make sure that Dr Thompson understands that you're asking her about the position as of today rather yes. than as of 2018. Right. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, you follow that, Dr Thompson? Yes, thank you. Um, and I take it, though, in this section, there's not a difference between what was the position at the time of the report compared to today in terms of the policy for centre and it being in that circuit breaker intervention um, style purpose. Yes, that's correct. It remains the same. Now, given that um, under the legislation there's an initial 21-day um, period for admission to the centre, um, the question that you've raised here, paragraph 37, about how long does a therapeutic intervention take um, what's to be done at the centre um, has to be that type of priority stabilising of the behaviour within that three-week period, unless there's some exceptional circumstance that an extension might then extend it to 42. But that's, that's the time frame that you're looking at within the centre when children come in. Yes, that's the current... Uh, legislation and policy around our service. And from that rationale and the purpose and that time period, um, if we go back to the question about the distinction be between therapy in that normal sense and the therapeutic care service, it, it isn't the case that it's intended at Cath French that children coming in for that circuit breaker and period of time to stabilise that there's going to be a focus on providing them with treatment or therapy in those ways that you described. That's correct, yeah. The traditional definition around therapy and treatment is not what's provided. We provide a therapeutic care environment. And is the idea then that when the behaviour has stabilised, um, let's say it happens in the three-week period, then the child would then be able to return back to another setting, not a secure care setting? Yes, so the child will then return to whatever care arrangement is in place to support them going forward. Which could be um, going to uh, a residential um, care setting or it could be going to a foster care setting or some other environment. Yes. Uh, what's then critical is, um, I take it, that once the child has come back from the centre, um, back into one of those other settings, that there needs to be a continuity of um, supports and care to meet whatever the needs were um, that may have led to the initial admission into Cath French. That's right. The aim would be to ensure that those children have the supports that they need in the community so that they can be safe upon their exit from secure care. And within Cath French, when in that 21 day period or 42 day, let's just say 21, in that period during the circuit breaker time, is there um, assessment that's carried out to determine the causes of 
the behaviour or the dysregulation of behaviour that led to the child coming into the facility. This is where it comes down to the definition of assessment and what people are hoping to achieve in that space. In regards to what happens currently at the Cath French Centre, we have predominantly a focus on observational assessment. So our staff are trained around understanding trauma and we also have the oversight of a senior clinical psychologist. And given that we have 24-7 care of these children, it provides us with a unique insight into what might be going on for them and what might be underlying some of those pain-based behaviours that we see that lead to them being unsafe in the community. And so as a result of their time with us, they will also have input from an education officer who might be able to speak to some of the challenges or strengths that they have in relation to their education skills. And we also have an assessment done by our medical team and they are able to highlight any areas of concern in relation to physical health um, and also if there's any other standout concerns in that area. And we compile all of that information into a comprehensive discharge summary with recommendations going forward for the district as to what that child might need. And a lot of that will also speak to the day-to-day -day care of that child in terms of how carers and staff might best respond to be able to support that child in the community. And once those things are done, just following through to then the child um, coming back into community, whichever setting it might be, all the while is it the case that in conjunction with what's happening at Cath French, there is still a case worker or a case manager within the child protection unit that is responsible for the overall care and care plan of the child? Yes, yeah, so the, the child's case manager, who is usually the person who has done the referral to Secure Care, remains the case manager and guardian of that child throughout the process. Secure Care doesn't take over that uh, case management yes. role. And so we're able to continue to collaborate with that case manager. And for children who do need assessment in the more formal sense of the term, so whether that be a neurodevelopmental assessment or a psychiatric assessment, then the centre works with that case manager to identify an external practitioner who can come into the centre during the child's stay and conduct those assessments as required. And on the, the transition out from the centre, um, is it the case manager then who is responsible for following up and ensuring that the relevant supports or services that may be needed for the child are put into place? Whilst we do rely on the case manager being the, as the primary guardian, someone who holds responsibility over those actions, in terms of the recommendations that are made, these are often discussed in a child's planning meeting where their broader care team might be involved. So that may include um, other, in, other members of the department. It may include carers or residential care staff who may also take on some responsibility in how we support that transition in the child's needs when they leave secure care. But the sole responsibility will lie with the guardian in relation to implementation of, of some of those recommendations. Now, you spoke a moment ago about the, the difference in how one considers the word assessment. Mm -hmm. um, as with many things in, in your field and in this area, the terminology may mean different things in different contexts. But here, when you're talking about assessment, you mentioned about um, the process of observational assessment by staff. Looking at page 37, at the bottom of the page, um, you'll see that in the next paragraph down, you refer to the well tree model. And then um, going to the end of that paragraph on the first column, um, you've referred to broader treatment and support being seen as a responsibility of other services in conjunction, uh, in adjunct to secure care and including post-secure care treatment in the community. Mm -hmm. So you're talking there about um, the follow-up and the transition, what other services supports happen outside of, of Cath French. That's right. Yes. So in that paragraph, I'm identifying the fact that some children may need individual therapy. They may need further assessment or input from perhaps a health service. And so it's also important to acknowledge that some of the recommendations and the care that a child need may lie with other agencies or services in the community. 
in terms of what then um, might be seen as what happens in Cath French to address the behaviours, if we read on in the next column, um, the top of the next column on page 37, you've written about stability is seen to have been achieved once the child can understand and demonstrate the importance of their health and personal safety. Mm -hmm. Now, elsewhere, um, we've seen reference made to um, psychoeducation um, as a concept. Is that what we're talking about here, that one of the purposes is to enable the, the child to understand what their behaviour is and what may be a trigger for that behaviour? So there's a number of things that will contribute to a child being able to understand what's going on for them and, and how they can be safe and understand some of their trauma. Part of that is done through psychoeducation and that's the provision of various activities and discussions with our staff and our education officer, which have a focus on understanding safety and emotional regulation. So we do have work that occurs in that space. However, a lot of work is also done simply through the interactions of our day-to-day -day care staff. They provide therapeutic discussions which aim to help a child explore what's going on for them and also provide opportunities um, where the staff can observe and provide feedback to the child so that when they experience uh, emotional dysregulation whilst they're in our service, we can respond, we can unpack that with them and we can help them identify ways that they can regulate. So that's done both through psychoeducation and through the relationship that they have with staff and the engagement that occurs in that space. Arguably, there are also other people in a child's care team who would be having these conversations and depending on the child, they may also have other clinicians involved in their care who would also feed into they're learning in that space. As we go down that paragraph at the bottom, bottom sentence, uh, you've written, as such, once a child has achieved basic levels of understanding and ability in the areas of safety and health, they will be seen as ready to be released from secured care. Um, so that, that level of basic understanding and ability, do we take it that that's that's the primary goal in the stabilising of the behaviours and then working to the understanding. That's what's hoped to be achieved in the 21 days. That's what we're hoping to achieve in that period. And at this, this section of the report doesn't just speak to the Cath French Secure Care Centre. It does talk to all services captured under intervention. And that's where the reference comes to the Welltree model, which at the time of writing this report had not yet been implemented at Secure Care. In yes. relation to stability, yes, we are talking about in this space how to, to make sure that a child can understand their safety and health, and that is, is what we're aiming to achieve in a stabilising phase, yes. And does where, where, that... where does the Welltree model come from? So the Welltree model was established by an individual from Scotland, although the model itself and all the framework is being utilised in a number of Irish secure care services and a couple of the Scottish secure care services. I thought we were told yesterday, I may not be remembering accurately, that it had something to do with Cornell University. Is that right? So the reference to Cornell University made yesterday is in relation to the therapeutic crisis intervention model, which is uh, separate to this, and it is the model in which our staff are trained in order to provide co-regulation and support to our children. I see. Thank you. Uh, now I'll, I'll take up some more with you shortly. Dr. Thompson, about the Welltree model. But just to finish off this section, um, given that, um, that goal that we've just discussed about what the primary purpose of stabilising and understanding the behaviours is, does that mean that um, what may be driving or causing the root cause of the behaviours um, in terms of a... Um, a particular behavioural issue, a disability, a psychosocial disability, those things are not addressed as such in Cath French. That would need to happen outside or through other service providers and professionals. 
I think that it's not a simple yes, no answer to that question in the sense that psychoeducation and therapeutic support and responding from a team does help a child in their journey of understanding and learning about their trauma and how they can be safe. However, we are stating that in this circumstance, further treatment in the formal sense of the term is something that we would also need the child to be receiving outside of secure care in order to fully address the underlying trauma that and the other factors that contribute to that. So that's in reference to the current status of the Catherine Secure Care Centre. Yes, and, and that would also be needed, wouldn't it, to ensure that there wasn't a risk of a return of the child back um, to Cath French with the same types of behaviours that may come from the same root cause, notwithstanding the period of stabilisation and psychoeducation and other intervention which has already occurred. Yes, that children will need ongoing support to, to like you're suggesting, address some of the root cause of what might be contributing to those behaviours in the community. Can I just ask you about that Welltree model? Um, go on the report, please. If we uh, turn back firstly to page 29. <clears throat> One section in the report commencing at page 29 deals with different models of care. Um, and so the section we just looked at, at about purpose is something might flow from whichever model we're talking about. But models of care, these are, these are um, do we understand these as being theoretical conceptualizations of a framework for a secure care um, setting? Yes. So the models that are described in this section are the ones that I observed in the various secure care services although these models can be utilised in other settings. So the sanctuary model, for example, is used here in WA, not just in secure care, but also across our residential care and also in other community service organisations. Yes, it's, it's something which might be used in a setting which is a human services setting, not necessarily um, for out-of-home care or child protection. Yes. Um, Sanctuary model, which is referred to at the bottom of page 29 in the, the green section. Um, as I understand it, that was previously the model that was being used at Cath French. That is currently the model that is used at Cath French and has been in place across residential and secure care for a number of years. I see. And then if we go over the page then to top of 30, um, you referred to the Welltree model there. Yes. Which is the one you spoke about earlier. Yes. Now, the, the Welltree model is also now employed at, at Cath French. In relation to the Welltree model, the Welltree model is an overarching, as you're saying, a theoretical framework that guides practice. And the Welltree model has an outcomes framework. So in collaboration with the developer of this model, what we've done is that we have adopted the outcomes framework that is used under the Welltree model. And that is what's been integrated into our service and it has fit quite well with our sanctuary model. So it's not that secure care has switched the overarching theoretical model that we're using. It's simply that we've adopted an outcomes measure that was captured under this Welltree model so that we can best monitor progress of children in our service. I see. So we... This would now be uh, the Welltree Wellbeing Outcomes, I think is how it's described elsewhere. Yes. yes. Now, how, how are the outcomes of wellbeing under that model measured? How do you say that this is, you can assess the outcome here? So the Welltree Wellbeing Outcomes Framework has six domains of wellbeing that speak to, um, I suppose, the overall picture of where a child might be at. It is, as I said, it has six domains and there are 33 items throughout that measure. In other services, they use the entire framework when they're measuring change for a child. However, how it's been adopted at the Cath French Secure Care Centre is that we highlight five to eight key indicators that we will then track for that child from the moment that they arrive to the moment that they leave. 
And due to the nature of our service, we are focusing on items that speak to a child understanding safety, understanding their health. And also, usually we would select an item that is in relation to hope about their future. So those are the three key things that we see as most relevant to children under the current service that we function. The indicators that we select, there are a few that are similar or are the same for every single child that comes to our service. And we also select a few indicators that are specific to what that child might be presenting with. So for example, for the children coming to our service, we would select five indicators one will be speaking to a child's emotional regulation skills, one might be speaking to their understanding of safety, and one might be speaking to uh, their hope for the future. And if the child is presenting with, say, some struggles with substance use, then there is an item that speaks to a child's understanding of the impact of substances on their well-being. So we would select that as something that is relevant for them. What we do in this space is then we well, usually the senior psychologist is the person who will select which indicators are most relevant based on the information we have in a child's referral. And we send that to the care team that works around the child and asks them to provide some scoring around where the child might be at in relation to those things. Our staff use those indicators as a way to guide their practice. So the staff and our education officer, will they design our daily program activities to best address those five things. So in a sense, they provide us with a focus and a way to orient the goals for what we might achieve in that three weeks. Now, you, when you talked earlier about um, assessment and observational assessment being within that um, idea, particularly at, at what's happening at Cat French, is this where it fits into the wellbeing um, outcomes that, the care team members are making those observational assessments of the child and then scoring those against the domains from the wellbeing um, outcomes framework to identify a, a, a raw score or scores in particular domains. Is that how we understand it? So that's one of the ways that our observational assessment contributes to, well, that's how it fits with the wellbeing framework, yes. And then going back to the the overall goal of ensuring that the stabilisations happened and that the, the child now has the necessary understandings um, at that basic level for release, does that mean then that um, you're looking for a particular score or a particular level reached across the domains that have been selected before you can say, we can now measure and assess that you have reached that level? In terms of the scoring that a child has in relation to this outcomes measure, it would not impact on whether or not they are released, if I understand your question correctly. So how does it relate then to that overall goal of one that we looked at at page 37 of meeting, getting to that basic level so that the child can then be released? What it does is it informs us as where the child is at and what kinds of supports we might need to put in place to in order to progress them to the next stage. So it does give us some useful information about what a child might be capable of and therefore can inform what they need. It has been discussed in the Irish service whether or not this sort of outcomes measure should impact on the decisions around how long a child remains in a service. However, given the legislation and the short timeframes that we have in the Cat French Secure Care Centre, it would not be a fitting way to, be, to make decisions about a child's readiness to leave. It does give us useful information about how we recommend and support the child going forward. Now, the two aren't necessarily one must be met before the other can occur, okay. but... Um, how then is the assessment made that the child has achieved the basic levels of understanding and ability so that they may be released? In relation to when a child is released, that decision is discussed in each of the child's meetings. What we find is that for a number of children who come to our service, a lot of the behaviours that may have placed them at risk in the community are no longer present simply because of the nature of our service that children aren't able to 
use substances, they're not able to to leave or to go to unsafe places in the community. So often a lot of the behaviours are no longer present whilst they're in secure care. So from that perspective, there is an element of stabilisation of the behaviours because a number of them don't occur whilst they're in our setting. But but then one of the things that must happen, though, that you encounter is Mm -hmm. once the child goes back to the setting where those behaviours were exhibited, unless those things are addressed outside, there's likely to be a repeat. There are a number of children that do return to our service. And as you've highlighted in some of the previous statements, that without addressing the root cause of what leads to the pain-based behaviours that we see, that it's likely that we'll continue to see children in need of secure care. Now, uh, Dr Thompson, in... In this particular hearing that we're having this week, um, we're we're focused upon uh, First Nations children with disability in out-of-home care. And here in your um, evidence, we're looking particularly at the secure care within Cath French, but in the overall picture of where that sits within um, what I've just outlined. I take it you've read and seen the statement provided by Um, Ms Calders, which was provided as part of her evidence yesterday, and you're aware that there is an over-representation of First Nations or Aboriginal children in um, out-of-home care in Western Australia. Yes. Uh, And in particular, um, in the Cath French facility over the past 10 years. Yes, I'm aware. And, And I take it you're also aware that there's a a high proportion of those children that have complex disability needs um, as part of their, their, their presentation and their circumstances. Yes. Now, in those, for children in that um, category, um, are you able to tell us what specifically is done at Cath French to um, address, assess, however it might be described, the the disability um, needs of those children that are coming into the facility? At our service, we aim to provide an individualised approach for all of the children coming to us. So that means we are collecting as much information as we can that is already available about a child and we review their files and speak to their care team so that if there's any information that can talk to us about a child's level of functioning, their disability, or any other um, important information about their, their current well-being, then we would use that to guide the way in which we respond to the child day to day. And so that information is put together by the psychologist at our service and then translated into particular recommendations and support that we would provide during their stay at secure care. So I acknowledge that there are some children who are yet to be fully assessed. And so where possible, when we speak to the care team in the beginning, if there are any outstanding assessments or areas that need further investigation, then we collaborate with the districts in order to arrange for assessments to occur whilst a child is in secure care. So that may be drawing on services that are already involved with a child or referring to a private service or attempting to get another practitioner come to see the child whilst they're with us in order to have that assessment completed in the three-week period. The issue we have in that space is often the availability and resourcing in order to provide that kind of response in a timely fashion to children in our service. Hmm. We also rely on our feedback from the psychologist, the health team and our staff and our education officer to raise or highlight any areas that they feel the child may be struggling and highlight if there is a need for that formal assessment. And we do our best to arrange that, but it is a challenge to be able to make such arrangements in such a short time frame. Now, because of the short time frame um, for what you've just said, it's not possible for the Cath French um, service to be performing that primary functional role of attempting to address those underlying um, complex disability needs. It may be that 
the centres working in collaboration or referring or assisting with um, having those addressed by others? I think that it's a joint response in the sense that the therapeutic care the staff provide inherently is responding to the trauma in a way that aims to improve the child's well-being. So that does contribute to a child's yes. healing experience. However, in order to, when we're talking about their need for formal assessments, neurodevelopmental assessments and psychotherapy and other treatments, then we do rely on collaboration with other practitioners and organisations in able to provide that to our children. And as I've said, that's quite difficult to be able to have that kind of responsiveness given the time frame. So we do rely then on recommendations of having that occur when a child leaves our service as well and returns to the community. So when the child is leaving, if there are those indications or those needs, does Kath French provide a, an exit recommendation or something which goes to the caseworker or to the care team to say, these are the things that must be followed up to address those matters in, in the next stage for the child? That's correct. We do as much as we can within our time frame, but in the discharge summary that's provided to a district in the care team, it will outline any areas that we feel have raised concerns and that might need further exploration for that child. Can I ask you, um, Dr Thompson, a bit more then about um, the 21-day th period? If we could just go to page nine of your report, please, um, which is just in the the summary introduction section. You'll see um, page nine that you've set out in those little uh, boxes there a number of key points. Um, and the second one being referring to the short time frame for the 21 days that often doesn't allow for meaningful change to be consolidated. Um, <clears throat> and then you go on to say, resulting in almost 50% of children returning to secure care after their initial admission. Now, that's a very brief... Is this, is this page nine, did you say? Yes. Yes, page nine, Chair. It doesn't have a number in the bottom right corner. It's got a teddy bear's face. Hmm. Uh, my page nine says something different, <clears throat> and the reference to 50% coming back is on page, different page, I'm trying to find it. Anyway, I'll sort it out in due course, no doubt. Yes, I'm not <clears throat> sure, Chair, but we have on the screen, if that assists uh, the relevant page, Now, Dr. Thompson, I was just taking you to that one uh, box on page nine about um, juxtaposing the, the short time frame with the 50% uh, of children returning after their initial admission. Um, in the middle between those two figures in that box, you, you've summarised that the short time frame doesn't allow for meaningful change to be consolidated. But from what you've been saying, though, that what may be the meaningful change here are the, the therapeutic services that you've been talking about that can be done at Cath French, as well as whatever else might be arranged in that time period to address underlying issues or complex disability needs, things of that nature, by others who aren't necessarily within the service itself. Sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, so what I was drawing your attention is that in that where you talk about meaning, not enough time for meaningful change to be consolidated, um, in the 21 days, though, the things that are being done there aren't intended to necessarily address the issues that might stop the child repeating the behaviours or continuing to engage the behaviours and coming back. It's, a, it's the start of it, perhaps, but not necessarily what would prevent it. Yes, what you're saying is that it would be the start of a process 
and that that needs to be continued as the child transitions out into the community. And the difficulty that we have in that space is that there's very limited resources available to children and able to support the transition that we would hope for. And arguably for a portion of the children, they end up back in secure care repeatedly. And so the question is then asked as to what do we need to do in the secure care space, but also what do we need to be doing in that transition space to be able to intensively support our children in the community so that they don't have to return to secure care to have that stability that they're needing. And, and it would be not only just not returning, but not entering into secure care in the first place. Absolutely. And I think it goes without saying that early intervention and prevention is, is what everyone is, is aiming to achieve so that we can minimise the use of any kind of service that deprives the child of their liberties. And I take it following that, you'd accept then in terms of where resources might be allocated in a preventative way, they would be best targeted to go towards the early intervention and the supports before the need arose to consider secure care in the first place, or if a child's been in secure care, to make sure that those resources are allocated in a way that are going to address the root causes so the child doesn't come back. I think that the answer is that resources are needed for both. We do want to prevent children from ever entering into any kind of restricted environment and the hope is that we can keep them safe in the community. However, there will likely be a smaller portion of children and I think it's important to reference that when we're talking about the children at the Cath French Centre, this is a small portion of children but they are in need of intensive supports and so we really need resources at both ends so that when the decision is made that a child is deprived of their liberties that we are providing them with as much resourcing and responding to all of their needs as best we can. Now, one thing that you've mentioned earlier was um, the, the issue about what's available in the community to, to ensure that there isn't that return or that entry in the first place. What, what um, is the situation and, and do you have any views about what might be done, Dr Thompson, where... In Western Australia, for example, you've got a very large um, geographical area and communities that are very remote, regional and remote, but you've got one secure care facility in Perth, but services which may not extend necessarily to support outside the uh, metropolitan area in the same level to those regional remote areas. Um, what can be done for, for those communities and for when children are returning back to those environments? Can I clarify, are you asking whether or not secure care services need to no. extend beyond Metro or just general services no. for supporting our children? I'm talking about the early interventions, the okay. prevention measures and the supports if a child has come in and is being returned. Okay. I can only speak to my experience with the children that I've seen transitioning in and out of secure care. And I know that there is often a demand for there to be intensive placements for those children and that there is often a shortage of the availability of those intensive therapeutic care arrangements for children. And that is across the board and more so therefore in the regional areas where it may be more difficult to resource some of those intensive placements. In a number of cases over the years that I've worked, the department has developed bespoke models for a couple of children in order to best support them in the community. And I think that further work is being done and and needing to be done in how we can use what we've learned in those bespoke models to be able to, and whether that's provided by the department or another organisation is another question, but what can be done to be able to provide some of these more intensive transitional environments for our children leaving secure care because they are currently limited. And what about in that area, the the possibility or or potential to utilise Aboriginal community controlled organisations or um, Aboriginal communities to be able to provide those type of bespoke supports for children? I think that wherever possible, we absolutely need to be supporting Aboriginal controlled organisations to be leading the care of 
the Aboriginal children that are requiring that level of intensive support. Absolutely. Now, is that, is that something that is currently a, a policy or a, um, a proposal which the department is pursuing? Do you mean do you mean only in relation to children who Aboriginal children in secure care, or do you mean for Aboriginal children with disability uh, in care generally? Well, um, thank you, Chair. I'm talking generally because my question is directed towards not only children who've come in, but stopping children coming into the service, the, the Cath French service in the first place. So it's the wider cohort that I'm asking about. I can only speak to the fact that I know that the department has policies around ensuring that we are best able to provide culturally appropriate placements for our children in the community, but it would be outside of the scope of my role to speak to the department's broader standing in terms of their, their policies and intentions around engagement with Aboriginal controlled organisations more broadly. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Can we go then, please, um, in your report to page 133? Page 133 and 134, there's a number of recommendations that are set out and the way in which they're headed and you describe in your statement, I take it, 133 of those which are specific to Cath French, and 134 were those that were generally about secure care settings regardless of where they might be. That's right? Yes, that's correct. Now, for the ones on page 133, uh, at the bottom, on the right-hand column at the bottom, uh, you've identified as a recommendation that the legislation be reviewed regarding the length of stay um, to enable an extension of a child stay up to six months with greater flexibility around accessibility to the community during this time to facilitate transition. Uh, what's the rationale for that recommendation to extend from the 21 day period up to a six month period? The rationale for consideration for an extension is, as should be considered that this is not for every single child that comes into secure care that they would be remaining there for six months. That's not the intention of this recommendation, but that we do need greater flexibility so that for the children who need it, they are able to stay longer and receive the care and support, the assessment and the intervention that they need in order to be able to safely transition into the community. So arguably for a number of children who come to our service, they only need that circuit breaker and then they are able to be transitioned and do not return to secure care and are supported safely in the community. But there are a number of children who at the moment are being held in the secure environment based on a legislative time frame, which is arguably somewhat arbitrary and isn't necessarily responsive to where they are at and if they may need a, a longer time. I think that this is where we need to continue to have legislation to safeguard children from being kept in any kind of secure facility for an extended period, but that we also need flexibility so that in that three to six month period that they may be in a service, that there's much greater access to the community and that they're not entirely secured in the way that they are now. So I think that there are a number of children who require additional time in order to have the assessment and treatment and support and a safe transition back out to the community. And I think that when we look at the children who return to our service numerous times, they are already spending an extended period in secure care. And it would arguably be more beneficial for them to come to secure care once and have their needs assessed and met to prevent them from ever returning again, rather than have them going through a revolving door process and bouncing between our service and a number of other departments. So I think it's also important to note that any consideration to change the purpose and the intent and the model in which secure care currently operates cannot be done in isolation, but has to be done in consideration for the broader spectrum of care. Because essentially it doesn't matter what we would achieve in secure care if that child can't be supported safely in the community and transitioned out, then 
any potential gains from that space would be lost. Now, in that answer, you, you talked about in the if there was a longer period, there might be assessment, treatment and support. What you're saying there is, isn't it, that you'd be talking about a different model, a different purpose from the ones that we examined at the start of your evidence today, which was about the circuit breaker stabilising, getting that minimum level of understanding and um, knowledge so that the child could be released in the short time frame? It would be considered to be a more intensive response, but still would fall into that category of intervention. I think but, it would be more comprehensive than perhaps what's being provided currently. But you mentioned treatment as well in your, in your answer. Are you, are you suggesting that a longer time period might incorporate then treatment in the sense of things that might be more intensively done to address the behaviours, not just simply the ones that we talked about earlier in, in the current way in which the model works? What I would be suggesting is that for the children who require specific treatments, and whether that be psychotherapy or input from other allied health professionals, that there would be an opportunity to at least commence some of those treatments and have initial gains and a foundation set in that space, and that the child would continue to be supported with whatever treatments are necessary when they transition out of the service as well. This is really the thrust of your very interesting report, isn't it? You, you argue on pages 78 through to 81 that there should be a longer period available in the manner you've just described to Mr Crowley. And in, on page 78, you've got a chart which shows that the length of stay in uh, Western Australia of 21 days is markedly uh, shorter than any of the other jurisdictions to which you refer in that chart, and they are presumably the jurisdictions that you studied in the course of your Churchill Fellowship. Is that, am I right on that? Yes, that's correct. I and think then it's on, a, bit, sorry, yeah, please continue. Sorry, I interrupted. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say that whilst we are talking about there being consideration around an extension of time, that's not to be mistaken for wanting to have children secured for lengthy periods. And it's important to note that the models where children are held for longer periods they have access to the community and it is not as secure and closed as it currently is in our service. So yeah, no, I, I understand that. And what and as I read the thrust of your report in the limited time I've had to read it, it is that you want that flexibility, you understand secure, not necessarily to mean that for a particular child, that child has to be in effect incarcerated for the period of whatever it might be, three months or six months. It's a period where flexibility can be applied, transition to the community, support given. And on page 40, you say being able to offer formal psychological treatment in secure settings may lay the foundation for the children to begin their healing process. So that's really you're putting forward a different model than the one that exists now in the sense that it provides for assessment, proper treatment, and looking to the longer term and you understand, of course, uh, I, you clearly understand that there's a very difficult balancing act because you're restricting the liberty of a child, but at the same time, you're trying to provide the child with the genuine support that the child needs in order to avoid uh, the uh, continuing effects that uh, we've heard so much about, obviously, particularly for an Aboriginal child with disability. Have I got, have I got it right as to what you've been suggesting? Uh, yes, that's a, a good summary of, of the report and, and what I'm suggesting. And I think it would be, again, about making sure that that's individualised and that it's only for children where it's absolutely necessary because there are children who don't need to be in secure care for an extended period. And I suppose whilst this is the model that I believe is worth consideration, if we could be in a situation where children were able to be supported and prevented from getting to this space at all, then that would, of course, be what we all hope for. But for those who do require this level of intensive support, it needs to be a more flexible model so that they can have those needs addressed. And coming back to some of the issues that were discussed at some length yesterday, uh, people genuinely and legitimately worried about the deprivation of liberty and so forth might be comforted if uh, the flexibility could be overseen by a court or at least an independent process of uh, checking, as happens uh, for people who are... Uh, with uh, intellectual uh, disabilities who are uh, 
confined in some way at present, uh, that there's a regular process of review, compulsory, it doesn't depend upon applications being made, uh, so that you might build that into the system that you're considering. I think that any system that involves deprivation of liberty needs a, a strong safeguard to protect children from getting stuck in a service and being in a locked environment for any period of time and any efforts to safeguard through legislation and through having independent advocacy and participation of the child and their family where appropriate is essential for this kind of process. Yes, we have a distinction in this country where punishment for a criminal offence is exclusively the province of the courts, but there are all sorts of forms of detention, all sorts of detention that uh, are administrative in at least their inception. And that can include people with intellectual disability. It can include children who are covered by secure care. It includes uh, people seeking protection visas who are kept in detention. <clears throat> and the rationale offered by the High Court is courts don't need to be involved in that necessarily uh, because uh, they're not for the purposes of punishment or the application of the criminal law. But sometimes the distinction is uh, quite fine and no doubt is lost on some of the people who are confined. Sorry, that's a little homily. Carry on. Uh, Dr Thompson, is there currently a proposal um, that you're aware of, of for the department to consider an extension of the period to enable a longer stay like the six months that you recommend here? Is that on the table? So this report, my recommendations and some of the suggestions I have around changes that could be put forward to this model are something that uh, the department has this report and the information available to them. And I think that it's it's a big undertaking and it's something that is will be uh, looked into, but that has to be considered within the department's broader spectrum of care, which is a much larger undertaking. And I couldn't comment as to the department's intentions around um, that space. No, but just simply, do you know whether the department is looking at this as an option or not? The information around this is available to them and I believe that the Specialist Child Protection Unit has the information from my report and some of the suggestions and I can't speak to what they intend to do with that information. But I assume that they would come to you for your input if they were. Uh, yes, I would imagine so. They haven't yet? I've had conversations in relation to my report and I've had opportunities to engage in a number of discussions about the evaluation of our service and the implementation of recommendations from the evaluation. Uh, I have ongoing discussions, but we are not in a place where we're discussing uh, the, the remodelling of our service at this point. Can I ask you to go please to page 98 and 99? There's a couple more areas I want to take you to, uh, Dr Thompson. This one, 98, 99, this is coming back to the, the issue about the, the transitioning out or the step down uh, concept of how that fits within the, the overall framework of secure care. Um, and as you say on 98, in, in summary, that the transition process is just as important, if not more important, than what actually happens whilst the child is in secure care. Um, you're talking here about, um, in part, when the child leaves Cath French, that there is those necessary supports and services that are available to assist the, the child to make the transition so that they won't then again fall down or, or be exhibiting those type of behaviours that led to them being first admitted to Cath French. Yes, I'm, right. I'm sorry. Was there that's was there a question in that? Yes, part? I was just clarifying that that's what that my understanding is. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. And then on, on 99, you've given a, a sort of staged ideal world um, model of what um, might be a smooth transition for the ideal transition. Um, in yeah. in terms of what is actually happening or what may need to happen to enable that smooth transition. Um, you're, you're aware that there was a, a review that was conducted, um, an evaluation review of secure care that Ms. Col Ms. Call has referred to in her evidence. 
Yep, I'm, I guess I'm aware of the, rec the recommendations from the evaluation. Yep. Yes, and that there has also been prepared a, a document with an action plan of um, the department's response to those recommendations. You're aware of that? Yes, I'm aware of the document. Um, I just want to ask you about some of those points, please. Could we um, just swap documents for the moment and could we bring up the document WA.0011.0001 point triple zero one point zero six three zero i think this is tab 32 yes that's the one um, and if we could just have zoom in on that one please at point uh, eight on page three You see, Dr. Thompson, uh, in the table that sits out in this action plan, we have on the first column on the left-hand side the numbered uh, recommendations that came from that evaluation report. Um, and here at eight, the additional high support placements be made available to facilitate a stage or step-down approach for some or selected young people. And then if we track across, we then have... Uh, what the department's identified as the agreed actions that might respond to that recommendation uh, and its status and then any additional information about that um, particular matter. Now, what, what I want to focus you upon is in the additional information. Um, <coughs> you see there's, it sets out that there's been a referral to the Specialist Child Protection Unit uh, strategy and partnership to be progressed. And then the out-of-home care reform program will develop options for a complex community care service. Uh, the complex community care service, it's not just in respect of this recommendation, it features amongst some of the others, but I'm interested if you could help us with that to um, tell us what your understanding is of what's happening with that and, and the necessity for that particular complex community care service. I'm aware that the complex community care service is something that's being explored by the department, but I think that there are a number of suggestions in this space around what a step-down service is, and I think that complex community care is something that sits more broadly in the department's out-of-home care space, and it's not something that I could speak to in, in any more detail than what's offered in that document. All right, but do you know what currently is happening with progressing that recommendation? I, only what's in that document, which is that it's been referred to the Specialist Child Protection Unit and that that is being progressed. Um, I don't currently have any more information that I could speak to and it would be outside of my scope in relation to some of those discussions. Um, are you aware of, um, we had some earlier evidence given um, yesterday about recommendations that were made in a particular inquest in respect of uh, a, a young girl um, where a recommendation was made by the coroner for the department to fast track the implementation of its proposed complex community care service. Are you aware of that recommendation? I'm aware of the recommendations of the coronial inquiry, yes. And has this been something that's been raised or brought to your attention as something where your input sought about what might be done for this aspect of transition out of secure care? All I'm aware of is what's stated in that document, which is that it's currently with the Specialist Child Protection Unit, and I have no further information that I could speak to in relation to where that's at and how it's being progressed. Would be Mr Crowley, I think you're asking the wrong person about, <laughs> about the department's uh, uh, consideration or implementation of uh, recommendations and in a way it's not really fair to tax Dr Thompson with those questions. Yes, uh, thank you Chair. I, I'm only, I was only asking about any input from her and whether she's aware or not. not yeah, I understand. I understand. Um, can I ask you then please, could we go back to the uh, your report and can I take you then to <clears throat> Um, page 61, please. 
Now, page 61 of your report, um, you have identified a, a section um, about cultural safety and <clears throat> um, you'll see, as you've written there in the, in the introduction section, that in order for children to have a positive care experience, all elements of their well-being must be recognised and addressed. Now, I take it from what you've set out here and what your understanding and learning and experience is for uh, Aboriginal children um, coming into secure care, part of ensuring their well-being is the necessity of making sure their cultural, spiritual and emotional connections to their country and their culture is an essential part of their overall well-being. Yes, absolutely. And <clears throat> this, this section of your uh, report, although you make reference to um, the large numbers of Aboriginal and in New Zealand, um, Maori children being brought into secure care, your, your fellowship study happening overseas obviously didn't have a focus on um, Indigenous people in Australia. Did it? Yes. So one of the limitations of the information in my report is that as a Churchill Fellowship is based on obtaining international um, research, that there was less of a focus on, on Australian secure care services and also on Australian populations. And so it's noted that in order to implement the information in this report and the general recommendations that I've provided around secure care, there would need to be considerable consultation with Aboriginal communities and elders and organisations to be able to best translate this into a culturally safe practice. And if that, if I may say so, is a very sensible qualification, I think you would agree, would you not, that the jurisdictions you looked at are very, very different from Western Australia, each of them. That each of the jurisdictions that I looked at uh, have some similarities, but also a number of differences to our population. And I think even within Australia, we would need to be looking specifically at each of the states and regions that we're working with to be able to provide an individualised and responsive service in each area. Mm, thank you. Now, can I take you to page 134 of your report, Dr Thompson, uh, and just... Link this, if I if I may, for your comment to the recommendation you've made at the bottom of the left hand column about research is needed to assist in understanding risk factors specific to Aboriginal children. Um, in in part, this is risk factors you would accept that might be posed by dislocation and removal from um, culture and community and country. Yeah, I think that there's a number of factors that are specific to Aboriginal children, such as those that you've mentioned, that would be important to do further more research into. And you also then go on to um, recommend considerable funding is also required to ensure development of culturally competent service provision, um, including in early intervention and family and community support um, to achieve those ends of enabling support without dislocation from country, family and community. Now, this, you're nodding there, sorry, Dr. Thompson, uh, but this follows on from what we were looking at earlier in the report in that section about um, the cultural safety aspects, that this is something that you recommend that there be research and consideration of funding to enable those cultural safety um, considerations to be properly addressed. Yes, and I think it's important to note that this sort of recommendation isn't something that is relevant simply to the Department of Communities, but more broadly as, as a state in terms of how we invest our resources to best support Aboriginal children and their families. Yes. Now, with respect to that recommendation from your report, do you know, has there been any um, measures or any proposal adopted to um, take up that recommendation? I think that it's a very broad recommendation and that the department is engaged in a number of projects in relation to how we best support Aboriginal children and families, but it would be outside of my role and area to comment on some of those 
um, some of those projects that the department are undertaking. Yes, just pardon me, please. Um, in your statement, or the annexure to your statement, um, Dr. Thompson, you, you've referred to one particular uh, role. So paragraph 24 of your, your substantive statement document, um, which is... <clears throat> which is in relation to um, the multidisciplinary team. And you've noted there's an ongoing need for an on-site child and adolescent psychiatrist to provide assessment and treatment to children um, at, at the centre. But um, as I understand it, that role hasn't, hasn't been filled at the moment. There isn't a person doing that role within the centre. What we have currently is we have a relationship with a psychiatrist who video links in and speaks with our health team on a fortnightly basis and they can provide us with guidance or answer any specific questions that we have in relation to that field. However, that psychiatrist does not provide assessment nor intervention for the children at our centre and they aren't on site. So the department has been supportive and they have funded the uh, contract for us to have a psychiatrist on site. The difficulty lies in the ability to access a psychiatrist, given that there is a very limited number of child and adolescent psychiatrists in the state. Yeah. Just going back then to your report at page 133, please. I want to ask you finally about this other position that was part of your recommendation. Uh, you've, in your second point on the left-hand column, you've referred to or recommended a full-time position for a cultural specialist to provide guidance and intervention um, at the centre. And we've heard yesterday that there's a cultural support worker uh, position now at Cat French. Is that, is that the same thing that you're talking about in your recommendation or were you referring to a different role? The therapeutic cultural support worker position is, um, is reflected in our practice currently and is consistent with what I was suggesting in my recommendation there. I see. So that is something that has been implemented following your report? Yes, and I believe that it's not simply following my report but that it was also a recommendation of the coronial inquiry that that be established. Yes. Thank you. Those are the questions that I have, um, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your evidence, Dr. Thompson. I'm now going to ask the, my colleagues, uh, Commissioner um, Mason and Commissioner Gelbel, if they have any questions. First with uh, Commissioner Mason. No, thank you, Chair. Commissioner Gelbel. Um, thank you very much um, for your evidence and, and also for the report uh, the, from the Churchill Fellowship. I'm interested in the topic of children under 12, which you refer to, um, and, you know, what, what you're talking about, an, another um, sort of whole program that you think would be appropriate, that going into Catherine French isn't the right answer for them as far as I, I understood it. I wouldn't specifically talk to a separate program for children under 12. I think that it's important, though, that, I mean, all children, we need to do what we can to be able to support them to not enter a secure facility as much as possible. I think the concern was that in our service and in a number of other services, we're seeing children present with these behaviours that challenge and, and pain-based behaviours at a, a younger age at a point that poses considerable risk. And I think we need to do a lot more work into supporting how we can intervene early for those children to prevent it from um, getting to a place of secure care. 
And um, that brings me to my second question, which is about tracking um, the pathway of children coming into Catherine French and going so that um, everyone knows, everyone participating in residential group homes or foster carers or Catherine French or even Banksia Hill, that everyone knows what happens, what's, what is the pathway. Is, is that done as far as you know? so that you can get a, a real fix on, you know, the, the outcomes for each child over a period of time, like a longitudinal um, evaluation? The department's currently drafting an evaluation framework, which we'll be able to, we're looking at ways in which we can better incorporate data to track some of the experiences of children. However, it's difficult in the sense that that would be requesting data from a number of different organisations and departments, not just Department of Communities, and I think that carries with it a number of challenges. Well, that brings me to my um, final question, that, that in Catherine French, you're dependent on interrelationships with other departments that, are, that can be siloed, such as education for going in and coming out, such as um, Banksia Hill even, um, as well as mental health and other health. Um, is there work being done, as far as you know, to break down those silos and to force them to come together in a way that's um, quite hard for government departments? Yes, yeah, so we've been working to establish relationships in a, in a number of levels. We do have a relationship with the Department of Education and so we notify the alternative learning team about all of the children coming to our service so that there's an awareness in education around the children who are in secure care. We are working to have relationships with Bankshire Hill and having gone there recently to liaise with their service and we do our best to create positive relationships with each of the hospitals that we interface with when we're working with children. In a broader level, there are also uh, bilateral agreements and trilateral agreements that are being explored at a much higher departmental level to look at how we can better connect um, and provide a more um, consistent care approach to the children that are shared amongst those services. Thank you. Um, Dr Thompson, in your, as I've said before, very interesting report, you deal with the environment at uh, pages, uh, not the general environment, the environment of a uh, secure centre at pages 42 through to 45, and you explain that environment plays a key role in how a child experiences secure care and can set the scene for how they perceive their care experience. And you highlight that there's a growing body of research that uh, stresses the importance of building design in uh, uh, creating uh, an environment that meets individual needs. What is your assessment of uh, uh, the uh, Cath French facility as far as the environmental criteria that you've laid down in your report? What, what's your assessment of that? In relation to the physical environment, there's been a number of challenges that have been outlined in that space and it's uh, well known that it's not a purpose-built centre and that that has posed us with some difficulties. I think that we have recently had the opportunity to speak with an architect and raise a number of our um, concerns about the building and a scoping report is being put together to assess what can be done to improve that. And it was an opportunity for us to provide the feedback that we've had from children, from visitors and from staff over the years in relation to the building itself. Uh, you heard yesterday, I assume you heard yesterday, Commissioner Mason's question about the location of the uh, secure facility and uh, the, perhaps the inappropriateness of that. That, of course, would not be addressed by changes to the physical characteristics of the building, but uh, you're not aware, I take it, of any plans to change the location of the facility. I'm aware that the, the service, the, the building itself is being reviewed, and I think that given the comments made by Commissioner Mason yesterday, that it certainly needs to be considered as to the culturally appropriateness of the location of the centre itself, given the history that we have on that land. In your uh, report, you refer, and I think Mr Crowley is taking you to this, to a 
50% rate of uh, children being admitted into the facility and then coming back. You, I think, have been at the facility in your role as a senior clinical psychologist since 2014, is that right? Uh, 2016. Yeah. 2016. Has that 50% figure changed in recent times? I couldn't speak to the specific numbers. I think that it sits generally between 40 and 50% currently. One and of the things that, sorry, please continue. No, and I was just going to say, sorry, that it's the children that come back tapers off in terms of how many times they come back. So it's only a small portion of children who come back numerous times. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that strikes me about our exploration of this issue or the exploration of this issue is, as you say, that this is a very small proportion of a much larger group of First Nations children, Aboriginal children with disability. I wonder whether there might not be a certain arbitrariness, not deliberate, but arbitrariness in result as to which children actually go to the facility, because perhaps it wouldn't just be the 30 children a year who are admitted to the facility who have those kinds of complex problems. Do you have any sense of whether the children who do get admitted are in fact the most complex or is it, or is there an element of arbitrariness in how some get into the facility or are required to go into the facility and others are not? We have the legislative threshold is very high. And we have a number of consultations and referrals about children to come that could come into our service. And it's important that we maintain a high threshold and don't allow large numbers of children into the service. So only children who meet the high threshold will be permitted into the service. In terms of who is referred and consulted, we do rely on the districts and the case managers who oversee the care of the child to be able to identify a child who is at risk. And that... Um, is determined based on the behaviours of risk that they would display in the community. So we are relying then on the eyes of, of all of those caring for children in the community to be able to raise concerns about a child in relation to a referral for our service. Yes, without attributing uh, any uh, lack of competence or diligence in such people, uh, you would expect to be some expect there to be some divergence in practice and application of criteria and particularly in a place like Western Australia, which is uh, so enormous geographically and have very and has very different uh, issues arising in different parts of the state. As you said, there's a lot of different issues in different parts of the state, and I, I couldn't comment around how how people are applying um, their interpretation of whether a child is at risk. And yes, I won't. I won't press you in that case. All right. Um, I will inquire, uh, is there any uh, council who wishes uh, to ask uh, Dr. Thompson any questions? And in particular, Mr. Bitter, do you wish to ask uh, Dr. Thompson any questions? No, thank you, Chair. All right. I assume no other council uh, wishes to ask Dr. Thompson any questions? All right, that being the case, thank you very much, Dr. Thompson, for your evidence, and thank you also for um, that the report that you have done, which uh, is both extremely interesting and extremely helpful. Thank you for coming today. Thank you both for the uh, report and for your oral evidence. Thank you for your time. Uh, Mr Crowley, do we take now a break for 15 minutes? Uh, yes. Could we return at uh, 11.50, please, Chair? Yes, we'll resume at 11.50. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Mr. Crowley. Commissioners, we will next be um, turning our attention from the Western Australian secure care setting to Northern Territory and uh, having some evidence given in respect of the model that operates in that jurisdiction called safe care or the safe care model. Uh, we will be hearing first from uh, 
Nick Espy, who's the Coordinator of Community Justice at the North Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency, or NARJA, who will be providing evidence about NARJA's uh, views and concerns with respect to the safe care model in Northern Territory and the secure care practice uh, in that jurisdiction. A copy of the statement of Mr SB is in the tender bundle part C at tab 54. I tender that statement, Chair, and ask to be marked exhibit 16.24. Yes, Mr SB's statement can be admitted into evidence and marked exhibit 16.24. And with the statement, there are three annexed documents, which are also in the tender bundle part C at tabs 54 and 57. I tender those as well, Chair, and ask that they be marked as exhibit 16.24.1 to 16.24.3. Yes, the additional documents to which uh, Mr Crowley has referred can be admitted into evidence and given, given the markings that he has identified. Chair, before... Um, I commence with the evidence of Mr SB. There are some other um, ancillary documents, materials relevant to this aspect of the hearing that I also wish to deal with at this stage before uh, we go further. There is uh, a number of statements which of documents have been received from others who aren't going to be giving evidence. But firstly, Chair, there is a statement of Ms Beth Lovell from the Family Support Case, who's the Family Support Caseworker, Northern Territory Legal Aid Commission, a statement which is in the tender bundle, Part C at tab 87. I tender that statement and ask that it be given the exhibit 16.27, please. Yes, Ms Lovell's statement will be given that marking. Thank you. There is also then a statement prepared by Ms Katie Kelso, Solicitor in Charge of the Care and Protection Practice, New South Wales Legal Aid. A copy of Ms Kelso's statement is in Tender Bundle Part C at tab 88. I tender that and ask that it be given the marking Exhibit 16.28, please. <clears throat> yes, Ms Kelso's uh, statement will be admitted into evidence and given that marking. And uh, there, are th there are seven additional documents with that statement in the Tender Bundle Part C at tabs 89 to 95. I tender those documents as well and ask they be given the exhibit numbers 16.28.1 to 16.28.7. Yes, that can be done. Uh, what, if I may ask, is uh, Ms Kelso, what does Ms Kelso's affidavit or statement go to? So Ms Kelso, Chair, refers to um, the Sherwood Program and Sherwood House Facility in New South Wales and speaks about her experiences as uh, from the, as the legal aid solicitor in charge of the care and protection practice of representing and dealing with clients in that facility. That's, a, that's the secure facility or one of them in New South Wales, is that that's right? That's right, yes. yes I see. Thank you. Yes. Uh, finally, Chair and Commissioners, a, a memorandum has been prepared analysing the uh, available secure care literature. Uh, that is to be found within Tender Bundle Part C at tab 96. I tender that memorandum and ask that it be marked Exhibit 16.29, please. Yes, the memorandum will be admitted into evidence and given the marking of Exhibit 16.29. And uh, there are four documents that accompany the memorandum, which are in the tender bundle part C, tabs 97 to 100. I tender those and ask they be given the markings 16.29.1 to 16.29.4. Yes, that can be done. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Yes, Mr. Mr. Esby is on the screen now. Yes. Mr Ashby, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission, at least notionally, in order to give uh, evidence. I understand that you will take the oath, and then I would ask you, please, to follow the instructions of my associate, who will administer the oath to you. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes, or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Mr. Espy. <clears throat> Just to explain where everybody is, <clears throat> pardon me, um, Commissioner Galbally is uh, participating in the hearing from Melbourne. 
Commissioner Mason is in the Brisbane hearing room. I am in the Sydney hearing room of the Royal Commission and Mr Crowley, who will ask you some questions, uh, is in the same Brisbane hearing room as Commissioner Mason. <clears throat> I'll now ask uh, Mr Crowley to ask you some questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Mr. SB. Uh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting with those preliminary matters, but I didn't want to forget before we got into your evidence. Um, can I ask you, Ms. Mr. SB, if you could please just um, start by telling us uh, about yourself, who you are, where you're from, and what your role is at NARJA? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, so my name is, is Nick SB. Uh, I'm currently um, a lawyer working at NARJA. Uh, I've been a lawyer for about 20 years. Um, I'm, I'm also um, a local Territorian. I'm, I'm from, my family's from Alice Springs. Um, my Aboriginal background is um, in relation to Central Australia. I'm an Iron Demand. Um, I do have family connections um, across the Northern Territory. That, that does include the Top End and also uh, the Kimberley in Western Australia. Um, I refer to that in, in the context of coming from um, a large Aboriginal family, um, including family living um, in a remote regional and also in, in urban setting. So quite a quite a mix. Um, my family does include um, having experiences of, for example, um, taking my children through traditional traditional law ceremony. Um, being involved in cultural activities, having an understanding of um, the, the broader uh, kinship system and family networks, and, and there's also the various specific roles and responsibilities that families uh, family members have um, towards children, um, such as um, the roles of uncles as, as disciplinary figures and, and that sort of thing, um, avoidance relationships. Um, so have an understanding of that. Um, Myself um, and other family members historically have um, um, I've been involved myself in, in assisting in, in looking after a, a number of children um, in my extended family that for various reasons needed um, needed assistance needed needed additional care or an additional place to live um, for a number of reasons um, so I, I sort of bring that context into my way of thinking in this space. Uh, I'm currently working for NARJA. I've previously worked um, as a lawyer, um, predominantly in criminal law, but also um, in child protection uh, matters in the Northern Territory, as well as for a long period in the Kimberley. Uh, I've recently been involved working on the NT Royal Commission. Um, I've directed community engagement there. Yeah. I have also been involved um, in following on um, implementing um, law reform recommendations of that Royal Commission uh, as manager of uh, law reform at Territory Families. Um, currently, my role um, is um, coordinating community justice and, and engagement and reform work um, at NARJA. Um, Yes, thank you, Mr. Yeah. SB, for that um, introduction. Uh, now, for today, uh, the particular area that uh, I want to uh, ask you about and for you to, to tell us about um, is with respect to secure care uh, for uh, Aboriginal children, First Nations children in Northern <coughs> Territory in um, out-of-home care or under the care of... Um, of territory families. Now, I take it, Mr. SB, that um, today you're, you're speaking not only from the personal background and experience that you've described, but um, you're also speaking as a representative of your, your employer, uh, NARJA. That's correct, yes. And you're familiar with um, NARJA's um, views and, and what has been um, Naja's involvement and, and issues that Naja's raised to date with respect to secure care in the Northern Territory. Yes, that's correct. Now, I want to ask you then, um, just so we can understand <coughs> when you do speak about these matters, 
um, you're aware, aren't you, Mr. Espy, at the, at the present time um, that in the current secure care um, model that's operating in the Northern Territory, there's been um, two children that have been admitted into the, um, the safe house. That's correct. I'm, I'm aware of that, um, although they're not specifically Naja clients. Yes, not Naja clients, but you, you understand that, that. that uh, of those two children which have been admitted, that uh, one was uh, an Aboriginal child and one was a, a non-Aboriginal child. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and they, not being Naja clients, um, you haven't had any direct involvement in their particular cases? No, I haven't. Um, so your evidence today is not touching upon their particular circumstances. You're speaking um, as a Naja representative and from your personal um, experience working in the Northern Territory on behalf of Naja about the broader issues. That's correct. Speaking our general observations and, and concerns um, in the context of Naja's um, uh, advocacy at a policy level, I suppose. Um, and then also personal observations of here and also Western Australian context. Yes, thank you. Now, um, Naja itself, um, it's an Aboriginal community controlled community legal service. Um, just tell us about um, Naja's operation and what involvement it has had to date with respect to the uh, secure care and safe house model. Uh, Naja's the Aboriginal Justice Agency, Northern Territory. Um, we do have wraparound services, um, as detailed in my statement. Um, in recently, um, in recent years, um, there has been, um, in, in respect of secured care facilities, there's been, um, Nadia has touched on that in, in submissions um, to the recent NT Royal Commission um, into youth, youth detention and, and, and child protection. Um, I believe we've tended that those submissions. Um, recently, there has been um, correspondence this year in relation to concerns uh, about the secured care facility, primarily those concerns have been correspondence to, to the agency about the legality um, of or the lack of legislative framework around um, the current status of, of secured care in the Northern Territory. And that includes uh, two letters, I believe, that were tendered. Um, one from, from January this year and another one from, from April, um, raising concerns um, about, you know, the potential, well, the, the unlawfulness um, from the perspective of NARJA and NT Legal Aid, um, concerns about that um, directed at the CO of Territory Families. Yes, thank you, Mr Espy. Now, um, I might bring up... Um, those letters and take you to some parts of them so that um, you can further explain what issues Naja has raised um, in conjunction with colleagues at uh, NT Legal Aid um, and why those matters are of, of concern to Naja and your clients. Um, could we please bring up the document at firstly tab 56, uh, which is the document N ja.9999.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0
Yes. Um, <clears throat> have you been to the facility, to the safe care house? I haven't been to, to, to the safe, no, I haven't. Just going down to um, the, the second paragraph there, you'll see there's a reference to um, the authors of the letter referring to their understanding of the model being derived from the attached territory families document and a, a visit that had been conducted at the house. Now, the, the document that's being referred to, um, you're aware that there was a, a document which had been sent or had been provided to uh, Legal Aid Commission and NARJA, which was the Safe Care Framework and Model of Care document. That's correct, yep. <clears throat> now, just in terms of the concerns which are raised, um, just on the first page there, you'll see that there's a heading about um, transparency and the concern being raised about um, the document that was just been referred to um, did not appear to have been published and didn't seem to be available um, outside of um, government and elsewhere. Um, are you able to tell us about um, how it is the document was provided to NARJA um, and was it an invitation to comment how it came about that NARJA was writing back with the commission back to Territory Families? Uh, I'm not sure specifically of when um, we were provided the document. Um, it is now available. I believe it's available was published. Um, we certainly do have a copy. Uh, we, to my knowledge, weren't invited to contribute um, to that document or to any suggested comments or amendments, changes to that policy. Um, certainly um, would welcome the opportunity to, to make some suggested changes to it, but to my knowledge, that hasn't happened to date. Um, similarly, um, perhaps I'm jumping the gun, but similarly, um, our recommendation of um, legislative changes um, hasn't occurred, uh, notwithstanding that um, there's current um, drafting of, of reforms to the Care and Protection of Children Act in the Northern Territory by the department. Um, this this is not hasn't been prioritised as, as a, an area of, of reform. Um, to date, certainly this year. Um, and I suppose just taking a step back, um, that letter does also refer to um, almost 10 years ago when, when previous um, discussions occurred in 2012 and submissions made in relation to secured care. So there's been a bit of a, a, bit of a history of it. Yes. Now, if... If we just go over to the second page, just to follow on from what you've just said there about a previous um, proposal, the top of page two of the letter, it's noted that um, in contrast to the position with respect to the current safe care uh, house model, uh, back in 2012, there had been extensive consultation uh, and public discussion about what at that stage was proposed legislation. You're aware of what that proposal generally was at that stage about legislating a type of secure care setting? Um, I'm not aware of that, um, except to the extent that it doesn't seem to have happened and, and certainly their um, interpretation of where they're getting the power to, um, to detain children um, in this fashion is... is what we've detailed in that letter is, is, is something that we, we don't agree with, with the interpretation of, you know, combining the, the guardianship powers of the CEO of the department with the powers under the criminal code of the application of force, uh, generally speaking, for the discipline or, or safety or well-being of, of a child. It's um, That's, I could only guess that there was at some stage that was determined as, as sufficient and, and the uh, proposed reforms back in that 2012 didn't occur, but I don't, I don't know specifically what happened there. Um, 
as I said recently, as recent as this year, um, there's been these letters, um, but no, no invitation or, or discussion about contributing to um, the development of, of a bill. Um, we've had extensive, well, the community sectors had extensive involvement in, in recent years following on from the Royal Commission with um, contributing um, to amendments in the Child Protection Act um, as per NT Royal Commission recommendations, but this is another matter that hasn't made its way to, to that level of, of co-design or involvement um, by NAJA um, or, or any other agency in, in recent years. Now, Mr Espy, just so we can be plain, when you referred there to the, the, the Royal Commission, you were talking there about the Northern Territory Royal Commission into the t detention of young people in That's the Territory? Right. Yes. Um, now, the, as part of NAJA's role, uh, I take it that NAJA um, does, when invited or when the opportunity arises, um, provide um, opinion or submissions with respect to uh, potential legislative reform or legislative amendment? Um, we're invited. We, we certainly make every effort to um, where we, at times when we identify quite um, significant con concerns, you know, we, we make submissions or write, write to agencies such as with this letter. Um, but yes, when we get the opportunity, we do, but that is also subject to our own capacity. Um, I can discuss that subsequently, but certainly... A big challenge is, is having the, the the resources to to contribute to that because generally um, it's it ends up being you know our frontline lawyers, for example, trying to take the time to either um, brief um, management or contribute themselves to um, co-design or, or, or consultation on on um, things such as law reform or policy reform. Um, it can be very time consuming and um, as best we can, we, we certainly try and um, be involved. But yeah, it is a matter of, um, there's a lot, a lot more that could be, could be done and we could contribute to if, if we had the resources. Yes, and the correspondence that we're been going to, one of the issues that was raised was the absence of any opportunity to contribute or to respond to anything in terms of the development of the safe care house model that has now been implemented in recent times. That's right, yes. Yeah, you mentioned about the lawfulness and there's a section in the letter. Um, I don't want to ask you specifically about your, um, from your legal point of view, about what, you, what your opinion might be about it. I'm just going to ask you about what is set out there and ultimately um, why it is that uh, Naja, um, together with the Commission, has um, suggested that there needs to be a legislative framework um, for the model. So under the section here of lawfulness, um, there are a number of points raised. Can you just perhaps summarise the concerns for us? You, you mentioned earlier about... Um, in the absence of there being some specific legislation for this model, what is your understanding then about um, what is relied upon as the basis for um, children in care um, being placed in the secure care house? Um, it's relied on the, I think I just mentioned before, well, it's probably, I suppose, our assumption because the response to these, uh, both this letter and well, to this letter was was quite bare minimal, um, and didn't go into detail. But it's an assumption that it's relying on um, broadly section twenty seven of the criminal code, which um, talks about justified application of force and um, for things like you know parental discipline and that sort of thing. And then also that um, in in the hands of the CEO of the, the uh, of territory families um, having you know, parental powers or guardianship powers under our child protection legislation. Um, but it's it's pointing out or from the opinion of, of our service and, and 
the commission that that's not sufficient. Um, and then obviously the letter details um, broader concerns that, um, you know, there's, there's not really any um, parameters either in legislation or sufficiently in the policy that cover things such as um, an appropriate minimum or maximum um, in comparison to WA, um, for example, that has a minimum of 21 days, sorry, a maximum of 21 days with only one further extension um, on, a, on a stay at secured care. It's, it's quite well defined with, with the time periods, whereas here we have nothing in legislation, the policy um, suggesting um, we a starting point of a minimum of three months with not, I don't believe there's any defined end date or, or maximum period, which which is quite concerning um, to think that we're talking about um, detaining or depriving a child of their liberty without um, charge, um, you know, for their own good. It's, you know, having undefined period of, of, of detaining a young person um, should be something that has significant oversight um, in policy, uh, in legislation, um, because it's it's a serious matter. It, it's, it's a serious situation, particularly when we're talking in, in the context of the sort of children that end up um, in these facilities um, are children that are often exposed to um, trauma in their own lives um, and, you know, they're, they're children in care. So we are talking about children that have already had um, potential backgrounds of, you know, the traumatic events in their childhood, potentially the, the trauma of being removed from family and placed in care and balancing are we going to commit another act of, um, you know, potential trauma in this young person's life, you really do have to balance that up with, with strict criteria, strict oversight. Um, yeah, sorry, again, Mr. Again. Espy, can I just um, yeah. interrupt you there because there's, there's a number of things that you've spoken about there and I just want to break them down a little bit more to understand what um, you're, you're, you're saying. Naja's concerns were about the absence of the legislative framework. So you, under this topic area in the letter we're talking about concerns raised about the lawfulness and with that you've you've talked about the need for there this to be underpinned by a legislative framework now there were three things in there that I wanted to ask you to elaborate on if you could the first was with respect to um, the, the criteria what what is the basis upon which uh, a, a child might be deemed to go into that type of secure care setting, um, that there's a need for it. Um, why is it important for that to be something that would, would be the subject of legislative defined criteria? Um, sorry. <clears throat> because it, it is something that should be used in very limited circumstances. Um, we are talking, for the reason I just mentioned, it's detaining a child that, that hasn't necessarily committed an offence. Um, there, there does need to be oversight, but there also needs to be accountability. Um, a good example is the fact that, you know, we've just experienced uh, a number of years of, of um, trying to mend a broken child protection and youth justice system in the Northern Territory, um, serious concerns about the lack of oversight for, for children in, in youth detention, for example, um, and, and an accountability so that things are done properly and only done in, in the, the most limited of circumstances. Um, secure care shouldn't be about um, punitive measures. Um, there's concerns, there's, there's been significant concerns raised over the years about um, not only secured care, but, but more so children um, um, children in care being placed in, in residential um, facilities, residential care facilities and accommodation and the lack of facilities. Um, you know, an, an example is, is not wanting um, a secured care facility to be used um, for the two hard basket 
um, while we think about this maximum or minimum three-month period gives us time to think about what are we going to do with this kid. Um, it needs to be defined well, both in legislation and, and further broken down in policy um, to have, you know, very strict eligibility criteria. Um, it has to be a situation where, it, you know, that the child, um, and, and it's defined in, certainly in the, in the WA policy, um, I'm not going to comment on current practice, but certainly policy is defined that it, it needs to be a child that's not only a danger to others, but a danger to themselves. Um, I could go on about the various reasons, but there's a, when you then mix that with the political climate and, and the desire to please a quite at times angry public in the Northern Territory, um, there's quite a desire in, in this jurisdiction for, for um, children that are seen as, as, as troubled children or, or, or committing crimes to, to simply be um, locked up. Um, you combine that with um, concerns about racism in this jurisdiction and, and that's something that I just um, advocated for, a, you know, a strategy, government strategy to address racism. But, but there's, there's strong, there's, there's certainly a demand, a public demand and, 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 and hunger for just locking up kids, um, particularly Aboriginal kids. We've had, um, I mean, we've had paperless arrests in, in the Northern Territory. I mean, we don't need, um, you know, charge less um, detention of kids. Um, it should be done. It should be done in those extreme circumstances where it's for their own protection. Um, and there's a lot of other things that you can do to protect children yes. from their own behaviour. So this is really... Um, those extreme, you know, last kind of the last straw. Yeah, can I can I just follow up with that, Mr. SB? Just two things. Um, the last part of your answer there, I take it then that um, Naja accepts that there may be extreme circumstances or circumstances where there may be a necessity for a secure care type of arrangement. That's correct. Um, it's not Naja's position that um, such a regime shouldn't exist at all. Um, it is a situation where there are there is a need. Um, currently, obviously, there's the, the concerns detailed in these letters, um, but there is also um, similarly, um, and without going into detail, there's the situations that have occurred this year where we've written to the department um, about the absence of um, a facility um, for a young person um, because of the limited numbers in, in the current facility um, and, and because of the gender situation, we have a um, um, situation where there's a child that um, couldn't go into that facility um, because of their gender um, and subsequently um, that's directly linked to that young person ending up in detention. So there's yeah, sorry, certainly... Mr. SB, can I just clarify, are you, are you talking about a case this year where a child was um, proposed to go into the, the safe care house, but because of the, the gender makeup of children in the centre, couldn't enter the facility? Yes, that's correct. And was this a Naja client you're talking about? Uh, yes, to, to my understanding, it, it's one of our clients or, or has been a client of Naja. And was this, a, was this a child? Because in this commission we're focusing, of course, upon um, experiences of people with disability and violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation for um, people who are First Nations people with disability. Was this a person that you're you can say, had a disability? Yes, the, the, without going into the details of, of the, uh, you know, the, the client, the, it is a situation where there were concerns and assessments as to um, their cognitive abilities or, or potential learning disabilities and things of that nature um, that, that were of, of concern. So... Um, so yes, I, 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 without taking the matter any further, um, 
specifically or without without taking that on notice, I I would say from the information I've, I have that it is a client relevant, but it is a it is a person relevant to the parameters of this Royal Commission in in that sense that. I see. Um, and and from your understanding, what you've told us a moment ago, because the client couldn't enter into the secure care house, you said that they instead were um, placed in detention. That's that's my understanding that it's there's a direct link between this young person then ending up in detention. Um, yes. All right. Well, I, I might come back to that in a while, Mr Esme, but I just want to go back to the, um, perhaps to guide where we were earlier. I was asking about the legislative framework and particularly the eligibility criteria as to when child um, may enter into the secure care facility. Um, and in the context of your answer, you, you talked there about um, oversight in that aspect as in terms of the eligibility criteria. Um, is it a case that Naja has concerns or, or considers that the, the eligibility and whether those criteria are satisfied um, shouldn't necessarily just be a matter for the CEO of Territory Families, but the legislation might provide for that to be the subject of a court oversight or a judicial officer's decision? Um, that, that is... That would be provide better oversight um, so it's not limited to um, the department making a decision. Um, I do believe without having in front of me that that's the case in other jurisdictions, potentially Western Australia, but um, it is requiring of um, judicial oversight. Um, more broadly speaking, um, first of all, yes, it's oversight should be covered um, both in, in legislation and, and, and policy guidelines, um, which should include some judicial oversight and should include external oversight, um, I would suggest. Um, and again, it's broadly speaking, but um, the, other than the, the decision to um, utilise secured care, um, ongoing oversight, including um, from the Children's Commissioner, which is is, is currently occurring. Um, we've previously made submissions um, about external oversight, including um, an Aboriginal visitor scheme, um, an Aboriginal childcare agency uh, as other, or agencies as other examples of, of um, external oversight for, for our clients um, that would include or could include um, that, that cultural element as well. Um, so, yeah, just, I mean, that's essentially in relation to that oversight aspect. Yes. Now, can I then ask you about um, the second of the matters that I drew out from your earlier um, response, which is about you know, concerns about the time frames? Um, now, you mentioned your understanding was that there's a three-month minimum um, period under the under the policy that uh, currently exists for uh, an admission into the safe care house. Um, what what concern does um, Naja have about um, the minimum period, but also about whether there needs to be some other um, maximum period that might be the subject of legislation? Um. That's correct. It's certainly a concern that I don't know where they get three months from, um, that that's specified in, in, in the safe care policy as, as a starting point. Um, I suppose our concerns, or well, Naja's concern, is that it, it, it's not defined. It, it, it should be. There's been previous... Well, it's, sorry, it's contained in that letter, um, a position being a reference to the earlier 2012 submissions about, you know, 21-day periods. Um, that seems to be something a lot more um, relation to this notion of secure care not being a standalone option, being part of um, a collaboration of, of, of services planning 
um, the child's life and a transition out of secured care um, and actually fixing what's going on in their life. It really should be a circuit breaker, um, a short period of time um, for that intensive therapy um, to stop uh, whatever's happening in that child's life, it, a circuit breaker. Um, three months seems more like a holding pattern of um, let's see what we can do with this this young person. Um, and that's sort of, I don't think we've detailed in our correspondence anything specific about that, but um, the concerns of Naja and also, I guess, my own concerns and observations comparing, for example, Western Australia where I've, I've had, had some experience um, or had the personal experience that, that I've referred to in my statement. Um, that brief period of time as a reset, as a circuit breaker, um, seems appropriate. Um, but if you look at their policy, it, it does relate to them um, having a collaborative kind of wraparound approach, multi-agency approach. Um, I think they call, they refer to WA's uh, rapid response policy or something of that nature. So this is not a standalone solution. Um, it does, it's starting to, when you when you look at our policy here in the Northern Territory, it does kind of have that feel that it's trying to do more than be a circuit breaker. Um, I think the WA policy refers to, to it not being, a, specifically not being kind of a circuit breaker. Um, sorry, specifically to being, you know, something only of the circuit breaker. So it's not really defined what, what the idea is um, here in the Northern Territory. It really does need to define what is the specific purpose. It does have to be that, but it, it, it can't just be um, an option of let's fix this kid for three months um, because they're out of control and we haven't quite charged them, but we also don't have anywhere to... It can't be the too hard basket. Um, it really has to be the focus on fixing what's going on in that young person's life um, because they can't do it for themselves. That That's what it has to be about. Um, yes, thank you, Mr Espy. Can I just interrupt there? Sorry, but um, can I ask if we could just go to the next page of the the um, letter because this is this is relevant to what you're been talking about, Mr. Espy, at the, um, there's a number of dot points at, at the top of uh, the third page, and the first one is where we're focusing on at the moment, perhaps the um, <clears throat> where um, there's a reference being made to um, points that have been raised by the Law Society of Northern Territory um, in an earlier submission that's being referenced here back when the legislative um, proposal back in 2012 was was being pursued. Um, <clears throat> the first point there you'll see it is that there'd be a maximum length of therapeutic residential orders of 21 days. Um, the the 21-day period, that aligns with what your understanding is of the Western Australian legislation uh, and the idea of a circuit breaker. Is that that's yeah. the of what you're... Yeah. That's view right. is on behalf of Naja. That's correct, yeah. Um, now, what about at the other end, though, um, without there being legislation identifying a particular period uh, and it's left as a matter of policy, does Naja have concerns about there being an extension or a, a maximum period not being defined? That's definitely a serious concern. Um, Having an undetermined um, period of time that you can you can lock a child up is a serious concern um, because it's the same department here in the Northern Territory that should be providing the solutions if they haven't been able to find um, appropriate accommodation, appropriate um, services, it you know in in the public um, to be able to just keep ticking along and having a young person. Um, detained indefinitely is a serious concern. Just looking at the um, <clears throat> that list of points, the, the second one, which is the eligibility criteria, we've already covered that one. 
Um, the next point there, is, which is referring to um, practice standards, um, <clears throat> is that something that NAJA has been um, consulted about or, or um, views sought with respect to uh, Aboriginal children who might come into the, um, the safe care house about what may need to be incorporated in the practice standards with respect to those children? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, again, I'm, I can't be sure whether there was any consultation in 2012, but I suppose that's irrelevant with, you know, we're talking about 2021. To date, as I understand, I'd say the answer in recent years is no. Um, would we welcome the opportunity? Yes. Um, but to date, I don't believe there has been. Um, and I suppose in comparison, without steering off the track too much, um, yes, on paper, the WA policy um, seems, seems a lot more suited to what we're talking about here. Um, I heard the evidence of, of Peter Collins and, and Sasha Grenoff and others yesterday. Um, I would agree with a number of their recommendations, but certainly listening to that, um, in practice, there, there seems to be um, some concerns. And I think um, the report, independent report that was um, in, in recently developed in relation to that WA model um, refers to, to some concerns about practice standards and other things such as, um, you know, consistency with, with the application of um, the eligibility criteria and that sort of thing, um, as well as um, culturally responsive services as well. Um, yeah, can I ask you, Mr Espy, if we can just go to the next part of that letter, I just want to ask you if you can perhaps expand upon some of these points in the next lot of dot points where um, <clears throat> the letter goes on to, to note that there are some matters uh, other matters which have been raised that remain a concern in respect of the safe care house model, um, including the first dot point about uh, the model should document how a young person is supported in their transition out of secure care. Now, um, in terms of that matter as a concern about there not being a documented pathway of transition out, be able to just explain from um, Naja's perspective what concerns there are about that not being the subject of, of um, some prescription? Um, look, perhaps to, the best way of this is, is, is drawing a, a link between um, lack of, of you know, def, definition of, 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 of a trend or, you know, a transition plan um, you put that next to the uh, undefined maximum period of time, it, it really does cause concerns and, and of young people languishing in, in this centre without any, any, anything compelling um, and urgent, and, and urgent but also a thought out plan, transition plan. Um, I don't think I would advocate at all for, for a young person going into such a facility without any any transition plan because on its own it, I don't think it's it really is, it is it's going to you know it's the circuit breaker but if it's not the what's next that's that's where the concern lies that uh, you might um, be able to stop the young person's um, dangerous risk taking behaviour. For that short period of time, um, but putting them back in the same environment that's going to expose them to um, some of the same concerns, and, and I guess just referencing, you know, we are talking about young people that might have cognitive or, or learning disabilities, um, might have diagnosed or undiagnosed um, FASD or, or PTSD, um, things that affect. Um, their, their functioning um, that then lead them, you know, towards behaviour that puts themselves at risk, which includes 
dangerous criminal type behaviour, which includes putting themselves at risk of, of exploitation um, or substance abuse, um, but those sort of concerns, going back into the same environment, you really won't have success. Um, and I refer to my own situation with a relative in my care that uh, a big part of that success um, did include um, them having a safe and, and loving family environment uh, to come back to afterwards. That, I think, was probably a big part of it. But um, for, for some, for other children, and in the context of a lot of our clients, a lot of young Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory, um, they're going to potentially end up back in residential care, um, back somewhere where they don't have someone that they love or trust or, or feel safe with. Um, those are the sort of children that we would anticipate will end up in, in such a facility um, or by, and have to date ended up in those facilities. So not having a transition plan is, is a concern. Um, referencing my own experience, um, areas where it almost all fell apart um, when uh, my young relative um, did come out of secured care, included um, education not being up to speed and, and not being aware of, of everything that had happened. And essentially um, the young person um, coming at, having been had that circuit breaker experience, having a clear goal of wanting to get back into normal mainstream school, um, keeping away from negative older peers that um, exposed him to, to the, the the risks and the dangers that um, caused him to end up in secure care. Um, essentially, when education wasn't um, up to speed or part of that collaboration for the transition, it, 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 it meant um, having to battle to, to, get, um, to get the young person back into school um, rather than the uh, non-mainstream um, area of, of education, which was, was defined for um, disengaged children, uh, which essentially, and in, in the context of where I'm talking about a small town in the Kimberleys, but it, it's a similar context in the Territory where we're talking about quite often kids that are, are known to each other. So it meant putting this young person back in a situation where he was with all the kids that exposed him to risks, but also triggered um, PTSD, triggered were a trigger for his tra traumas um, and essentially, you know, it really could have undone all that that work. So I guess not having the transition means you, you really do risk undoing all the work. And, and again, it's a balancing act. You're balancing, this is going to cause trauma to this young person. We're going to deprive them of their liberty. Um, that's going to hurt. We know that. Um, but it's not going to be worth it if there's nothing at the other end, um, if you haven't got, got all, the, all the things in a row. Um, so, yeah, that's that's why it's a concern. Um, and just perhaps another comparison, you know, I referred to the situation of education um, in, in Western Australia and, and the non-mainstream um, classes or programs that often disengage children um, end up in. It's a similar context in the NT, for example, with children um, in detention um, often um, having certainly historically it's been been a case the case and it's something that I was made distinctly aware of from children in detention um, that I spoke to during the NT Royal Commission and they're often not able to go back to mainstream school um, in a similar situation that um, it was in, in Darwin where they have to go into um, re-engagement um, centres or, or, or classrooms which are often physically separate from their school. Um, getting back into some normalcy is, is not um, in, in the education space. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. SB, just, just so it can be um, properly understood, in 
your last part of your evidence when you were speaking about personal experiences, um, uh, you were talking about the WA jurisdiction there as opposed to the NT jurisdiction. That's right. uh, yes, just in referencing the idea of having, you know, a transition. Yes, from what you'd experience. In, in the model. Um, but similarly here, it's we need to have that here too. It's not really clearly defined in our policy. Um, and again, not in legislation. Um, but I, without that, it's 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 just one. It's one of the necessities, I think, um, because it, it's not a standalone solution, and yes. that applies in both jurisdictions. Now, can I can I ask you, Mr. Espy, just to follow on from that um, in the letter, the next several dot points that are set out on uh, page three there. Um, raise a number of matters about um, uh, family and kinship and, and cultural considerations. Um, are you able to perhaps just tell us if Naja has concerns about those matters in terms of clients um, that may enter into secure care, but particularly um, children with disability um, who may enter into the secure care facility, what, what importance there is with respect to maintaining and not depriving children of their culture, community, family and kinship? Um, that, that is a concern and, and, it, and I'd also reference our previous submissions to the NT Royal Commission. Um, it's referenced in our child protection submissions but also, and I don't think we did tender um, reference to um, our youth justice submissions, um, similarities of, of, of the notion of detention or, or secured care, but um, recommendations 88 and 116 talk about having um, smaller purpose built culturally responsive facilities, um, which is important for a number of reasons. Um, now, those those that, type of facilities you're talking about, um, are, are you doing speaking of those in the context of um, perhaps being in regional or other community areas as opposed to all in the one urban setting in Darwin? That's, that's correct. Um, that's a concern. It's a similar concern in in, in Western Australia. Um, particularly, for example, if you're right up in, in the Kimberleys and you end up all the way down in Perth, um, it is, you are far away, you have very limited access to your, your family, to your, to your country um, and, and community. Um, whilst we, we are talking about this idea of, you know, ideally 21 days or a very short period of time, um, you do have to balance that with, with being, um, yes, in an environment where you can, there can be a circuit breaker, but also acknowledging the strengths of, of culture. Um, and there's, well, my submission, it's an important um, aspect of, of healing um, and any sort of therapeutic treatment that someone um, has cultural responsiveness incorporated in that but it's also a re reference in other um i'm sure many other reports um the, the sexual abuse royal commission referred to um aboriginal culture there was a specific um policy paper they put out during it sorry i'd have to take that on notice for a more definite um reference but referred to culture as as a protective factor um for, for, for young people. Um, I need to I'll just go on further to that to say if you're talking about getting someone back back on track, genuine young people are off the rails, so to speak, um, putting themselves in danger through their actions, criminal life behaviour, um, exploiting themselves or being at risk of exploitation and um, substance abuse, generally that is um, a situation where going off track has involved being disconnected 
to their family, to their community, to their to their culture. Um, so disconnected to things that um, have a sense of strength to them. And when we are talking about the, the kids that end up in these facilities are kids in care. Quite often that's part of the, the, the problem is that they, they've been removed from that, um, been removed from their community. I mean, the anti contacts that means kids, you know, from northeast Arnhem Land ending up in Darwin and kids from other areas of, of Arnhem Land or, or the Tanami Desert ending up in, in um, residential care in, in Catherine or, or, or Alice Springs. Um, so it is a situation where those kids are often disconnected and that's part of um, the cumulative effect of, of, of trauma on them and trauma in the, in the sense that it um, has that disabling effect. Um, so I'm not sure if I've mentioned that, but I'm, I'm speaking broadly about trauma as it does have that effect of, of, of a disability to, to, a, to a person's normal functioning. Um, yes. No doubt you've explored that already. Um, but being in a facility that um, is close to home, is, is close to the the appropriate, the strong people in your family that can come and visit you um, to let you, you know to let you know that you're not just going to be locked up here forever and that and, and have a important role in the young person's life. Um, having the ability to have someone um, when there's language barriers or, or cultural barriers that um, you may not uh, have, you know, a, a treating psychiatrist, for example, understanding things, having the ability to reference um, someone from the same cultural or, or family background um, is important for, for things not getting mistranslated or lost in, in communication. Yes. Um, and the, the therapeutic nature of, of a facility that recognises your, in this case, your Aboriginality or, or any 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 culture, I suppose. But in our context here, it's um, kids most at risk, obviously being Aboriginal children. Yes, uh, Mr. SB, we're we're running a little bit close to time, so I just want to ask you two more things. Um, one, just to clarify something with you, and then um, to come back to something that's on the screen at the moment on the page we have. Um, Earlier, you talked about the other um, subsequent letter that was written um, by uh, jointly NAJA and the, the Legal Aid Commission. Um, that followed, as you understand it, a meeting whereby um, Territory families uh, met with both agencies to discuss the concerns raised in the letter that we're looking at now. And then following that, there was a further letter written back um, jointly on the 6th of April, 2021, um, where both the Legal Aid Commission and NAJA um, expressed disappointment about um, the response that had been received and um, nevertheless, notwithstanding there being a meeting with uh, Ms Jeanette Kerr from Territory Families that there were still significant concerns. Yes, and then it, essentially it's the same concerns that remain um, our perspective that they remain unaddressed um, and, and not responded to. Um, and again, we're open to in any way being able to contribute to airing our views, concerns, contributing to solutions. It's very much what our organisation is about, solutions for Aboriginal people in, in this sort of space um, and ensuring that it's done you know, in compliance with appropriate um, legislative framework as well. Um, so, yes, it, it remains unaddressed. Um, there, we're open to, notwithstanding the resourcing challenges, open to being able to contribute to um, appropriate legislation, policy and, and practice. Yes. Um, now, Mr Espy, last thing I wanted to ask you then, just going back to the letter we had on the screen, the final dot point on that page three, uh, which refers to uh, Aboriginal community leaders, community organisations and peak bodies must be genuine stakeholders in the process um, relating to therapeutic orders. 
uh, and the secure care facilities. Um, uh, that, um, are you able to tell us um, why that's an important concern that is held by NARJA? Um, it's important because otherwise, as history has shown us, with, with other concerns, in, particularly around um, the space of Aboriginal children in, in the justice system and in, in, in the care system, um, it's important that the Aboriginal community is involved. We have access essentially to um, the affected people. We hear firsthand accounts of, of where things go wrong. Um, and that's the, you know, a justice agency or, or Aboriginal health or, or other, other um, Aboriginal community organisations. We have access to that information. We hear the problems. We are exposed to that on a daily basis. Um, there has been opportunities, and, and, and reference said there is opportunities with things like the Tripart Forum that's implementing um, the NT Royal Commission and also subsequent Productivity Commission reports in the space of youth justice and child protection. Um, so we have come some some ways. There's a lot of work to do in having more of an equal say, um, but it is it's an important thing it's important opportunity um, for the community sector to be involved um, we're a small jurisdiction um, we rely on um, the government doesn't have all the answers or all the solutions um, quite often consultation is welcomed um, sometimes it's not but the challenge is that um, it's not resourced from our um, perspective um, I've mentioned the Tripart Forum, um, that's one example of where um, whilst we do our best to contribute, even there where we have at the moment uh, one person um, employed, um, their role is to um, be involved in, in the co-design of, of one aspect of this Tripart Forum, which is um, developing um, an implementation strategy for our recent Productivity Commission report. Um, that quite quickly is absorbing a full-time position. Um, there's a number of other things, and that's just one forum, but um, essentially having the ability to reach out to a service agency such as NARJA, um, whilst we, we have a holistic view of Aboriginal justice, um, we don't necessarily have the resourcing to adequately contribute um, all that information that comes through our door um, to our lawyers um, to our social workers um, that deal with children or, or deal with um, people coming out of prison or, or in the child protection space. Um, it's lost information um, if we can't harness that and actually use it to provide case studies, to provide the, um, the answers to a lot of the concerns of government. And Aboriginal organisations um, provide um, a culturally appropriate um, forum for Aboriginal people to be able to develop and grow those ideas that um, to date I don't think you can get that sort of, um, you, you can't foster that in, in, a, in, the, in a government environment and that is why they rely on, on the views of, of um, the Aboriginal um, sector. Yes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Espy. Um, those are the questions I have, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Thank, thank you, Mr. Espy. Mr. Espy, I'll ask uh, my colleagues whether they have any questions of you. I'll first ask Commissioner Mason. Do you have any questions of Mr. Espy, Commissioner Mason? No, thank you, Chair. And uh, Commissioner Galbley, do you have any questions? Um, look, thank you very much um, for your evidence. I, I was just trying to get a sense of the sort of the pathway from residential care to secure care and then back or to juvenile justice and whether you have a view about residential care. Um, the, you know, it's a big question and so, uh, yeah. I'd... Um, it's, I think it's, it's a sad situation if children end up in residential care. I know there are 
circumstances where there may not be any other options. Um, the fear is if a child does end up in, in secured care, coming from residential care, quite often um, kids that come through our door as youth justice clients um, are crying out for attention and, and love and care and then simply can't deal with it. Um, the amount of children that are in residential care and then end up um, in detention, it's, it's a very clear pathway. Um, and they're, they're alone. They're dealing with people caring for them that flock on and off uh, and are subject to um, a roster. They're not family. They don't get the inherited love and care that you do at home. Um, so I think if a child then ends up in secure care, that's only going to create more cumulative harm to their well-being. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering that question commissioner but I, I guess it, it is it's that it should be a last option um residential care um has a has a place unfortunately but there's a lot more um that needs to be done to resource um kinship mapping um so that we could when we could do that proactively if we were resourced properly in the, in the northern territory um and, and that's the space that the aboriginal um, community sector can contribute to. Um, we have vast family connections and networks and the ability to map families and appropriate um, kinship carers, family members and that sort of thing that can care for children. Um, the number of children that I've come across um, as a lawyer um, that have ended up in residential care, for example, and, and then ended up in trouble um, and then particularly when it's people that I know myself through, through professional or personal dealings and, you you know, the question is well, why why couldn't this kid be with uncle so-and-so or their grandmother? And um, the Aboriginal community, know, you know, that you have that ability of, of knowing the extended family networks, but that's not harnessed in a sufficient way to stop children ending up in residential care. Um the ability's there, um, and a lot of a lot of families are more than willing to help um, if it comes down to it needing thinking and talking about what do they need that that's appropriate for them to then be able to look after another family member. Um, the amount of times that you see kids in resi care that you know um, of a family member, or they tell you about a family member who you go and talk to, and um, their experience of trying to put their hand up and say, we'll, we'll help. Um, it, it's quite tragic that those sort of opportunities are missed. Kids end up not thriving um, in, in residential care and ending up down the wrong path um, and missing the valuable, important years of their childhood, or, you know, their teenage years where they're supposed to be developing emotionally and, and, and developing their, their minds in a positive way. Um, so, yeah, the opportunities are there, but um, th there's more we could be doing. And I know there's some steps that have been taken since the Royal Commission in that space to resource agencies for, for things like um, kinship finding and, and, and the like. And it's a space that we need to grow and, and harness that, that knowledge. Thank you. Mr. Ashby, I'll just inquire whether uh, the representative of uh, the Northern Territory at this hearing, Ms. Chalmers, wishes to ask you any questions. Ms. Chalmers, do you wish to do so? Uh, Chair, because some of that evidence was without notice, and I don't make any criticism uh, in that regard, I will be taking some instructions over the lunch adjournment in terms of whether we seek leave to ask some questions of Mr Espy, but my concern at the moment is where uh, that could possibly be uh, fitted in. Yes, well, I also don't want Mr Espy to be hanging around unnecessarily. I'm sure he has useful things he should be doing. I'm not sure where you are, Mr Espy. Are you in your office? I am in my office, yes. Would you be available after 2 o'clock, for example? Uh, I could be. Um, 
And yeah, I'm not right. any information as to. Yes, all right. Well, um, you can take your instructions. That doesn't mean that you necessarily get leave to ask uh, Mr. Espy questions. They need to uh, go to issues uh, that uh, may be contested. At the moment, uh, I'm not entirely sure what, if any, arrangements have been made between uh, council assisting Mr. Crowley and the Northern Territory as to whether findings are sought, if so, what sort of findings they might be. So you might, uh, during the luncheon adjournment, speak with uh, Mr. Crowley to see if that can be uh, sorted out. All right. Well, if you'd that be good enough, good. if you'd be good enough, Mr. Espy, to make yourself available in the same place at, at uh, it's 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, which I assume is uh, 1.30, is it Northern Territory time. And uh, in the meantime, uh, Ms Chalmers and uh, Mr Crowley will no doubt have constructive discussions in order to resolve whether any further questions will be asked of you. In the meantime, thank you very much for your evidence and thank you yes. for being prepared to give your evidence to the Commission and for the assistance you've provided with your written statement. Thank you. We'll adjourn until 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Mr Crowley, I assume everything has been resolved, or has it not? Um, matters have been discussed, Chair, and I expect that... Um, well, Mr. Espy is not required. I expect we'll be able to deal with any matters um, through some questions of Ms. Kerr. Very good. Um, I'll regard that as a resolution. Okay, yes. what are we now going to do? <clears throat> uh, commissioners, we are next going to hear from Ms. Jeanette Kerr, who is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Department of Territory Families, Housing and Communities, who will speak about the operation and administration of the safe care model in the Northern Territory. There is a copy of Ms Kerr's uh, statement in Tender Bundle Part C at tab 58. I tender that evidence and I ask that it be marked as Exhibit 16.25, please, Chair. Yes, Ms Kerr's statement will be admitted into evidence and become Exhibit 16.25. In addition yes, to you. that, Chair, there is um, <clears throat> documents that are referred to in the statement and attached which uh, are in the tender bundle part C at tabs 59 to 83, 25 documents. I tender those and ask they be admitted as exhibits 16.25.1 to 16.25.25. Yes, the additional documents will also be admitted into evidence and be given the marking 16.25.1 to 16.25.25. And finally, yes. Commissioners, there is a supplementary statement from Ms Kerr, which is at Part C, uh, the tender bundle at tab 84. I tender that statement and ask that it be marked exhibit 16.26. Yes, that can be done. So the supplementary statement will uh, mm. become Exhibit 16.26. And the two annexures to that statement, which are at tabs 85 and 86 of the Tender Bundle Part C, I tender those, ask they be marked Exhibit 16.26.1, 16.26.2. Yes, that can be done. Thank you. Now, uh, Ms Kerr, I understand uh, that uh, you are to uh, take an affirmation. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Yes, and well, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission uh, to give uh, evidence. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate, he will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms Kerr. Uh, I shall explain where everybody is, as it's a little complicated. Uh, Commissioner Galvely is joining us from Melbourne. Commissioner Mason is in our Brisbane hearing room. I am in the Sydney hearing room. And Mr Crowley, who will be asking some questions, is in the Brisbane hearing room together with uh, Commissioner Mason.
Mr. Crowley will now ask you some questions. Thank you. Chair. Um, Ms. Kirk, can you hear and see me okay? Yes, I can. Um, as we go through the evidence, I may uh, bring some documents up on the screen so that we can all follow, uh, but um, I'll direct your attention to those when we get to them. Uh, Ms. Kerr, can I ask you, please, if you could just um, commence by um, confirming for us what your, your position is, your um, role, and what your responsibilities are within Territory Families. Okay, thank you. Um, before I do that, can I please just acknowledge that I'm giving evidence on Larrakia land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future? and also acknowledge the First Nations people in the other locations the hearing's being held today. Yes, thank um, you. My name is Jeanette Kerr. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Officer for Families, for Territory Families, Housing and Communities. Um, after recent MOG changes, I now have responsibility for all families programs, out of home care programs, um, education and training and professional development, uh, family support programs, out-of-home care programs, including the intensive therapeutic resi care um, placements and the safe care health programmatically. I also have program responsibility for youth programs, youth justice community programs and youth detention and domestic family and sexual violence prevention. Yes, thank you, Ms Kerr. And in terms of um, the, the relevant legislation for um, <clears throat> care and protection matters that uh, are part of the responsibility of territory families, it's the Care and Protection of Children Act 2007, which is the principal legislation. Yes. Um, and, and it's under that legislation that the, um, when a child is placed in care uh, under an order, it's uh, through that legislation, the child becomes under the care of the CEO. Yes. Um, <clears throat> now, can I just, I've just got a note here, uh, Ms. Kerb, can you speak up a little bit louder, please, so we can hear um, interpreters as well at this end would appreciate that, uh, as would I. Thank you. Yes, I will. Now, can we just start off, Ms. Kerr? I understand that you're in a position to tell the Commission, uh, as of today, about um, current figures with respect to the numbers of children in care and, and a breakdown of those children in the Territory. Yes, I can. Yes, could you give, give us those figures, please, so we can understand the position today? Okay, today there's 962 children in um, out-of-home care in the Northern Territory. Of those, 48 are in intensive therapeutic residential care. One's in the safe care house and nine are in detention. And um, <clears throat> the balance... Um, apart from those in the intensive therapeutic residential care and the safe care and detention, are they otherwise in um, foster care, home-based situations? Yes, sorry, 904 in home-based family placements. Thank you. Now, the particular um, area that I, I'm going to focus on with you, Ms Kerr, in the questions this afternoon will be about the secure care uh, and the safe care model um, and the safe care house, its operation. But um, if there are matters broader than that, given your responsibilities and role, um, please feel free to comment upon those as well. Thank you. Um, I've just been given another note, Ms Kerr, that there's some difficulties picking up the sound at your end. Uh, are we able to get the volume louder or the microphone closer, if that assists? Is that better? Uh, I'm not sure, but we'll, we'll see. <clears throat> now, if you could tell us, please, Ms Kerr, about 
um, the, the safe care house and the model uh, in the Northern Territory, what it is and where it's located. Okay, so the safe care house is located on Foundation Road in Holtz in Yarrawonga. It's a purpose-built facility that was um, designed and built and um, operationalised about nine years ago, which was a combined uh, health child protection um, program because at the time the department responsible for child protection was under the health department. It was designed for a range of things, including secure care for children and adults. Um, that was, um, at that time, there was also a, a range of legislation that was drafted and a, a extensive consultations around the program. Um, in the interim, it was not used or it was used for residential, general residential care, and then it went into disrepair. It's had um, a significant makeover and we have recommissioned it as a secure care house, which we call the Safe Care House or Program, um, in April last year, 2020. Now, you mentioned there about um, there previously being a proposal to use the facility some nine years ago. Um, that, I take it, relates back to what we've heard about there being, back in 2012, a legislative proposal that was to be put forward for a framework for secure care? Um, there was, but it was quite a different proposal or quite a different model than now. It involved um, secure care for adults and children, people with disabilities, children with complex behaviours, um, forensic disability clients, etc. There's a twin facility in the Alice Springs region and it wasn't really a feasible option to progress, not least because putting adults and children in a facility is probably not suitable. And there was considerable disagreement um, about the length of time and purpose. There were, and there were different sorts of arrangements for um, just in relation to young people to enter, including um, initial interventions, treatment orders. Um, so it was quite a complex um, legislative model as well. Mm. But the, the facility um, itself, the house, was it built back then in anticipation of that it may be used when that legislative reform came into effect? Yes. <clears throat> so the legislation didn't go ahead, but the house was built, then used for other things, but now it's been repurposed and refurbished. Yes. I see. And in terms of um, since April last year to present, you, you in your statements referred to there having been two children that have been in the, in the safe house? Yes. Um, that's still the case? There's not been any change in the numbers? No, there's a third young person who's gone into the safe house. Uh, and as at the moment you've said today that there's one person, um, is that the new um, third, third child that has now come into the facility? Yes, that's right. <clears throat> and of the, the other two that came into uh, the safe care house, um, we understand that there one one child was uh, Aboriginal and one was not. Yes. Uh, what about the third child that now entered? The third child is Aboriginal. And of those three, um, has there been um, any of those three children with disability? None of the children have... Uh, uh, diagnosed disability or an NDIS plan, although assessments have been done um, and one is ongoing. I might need to explore that a little bit further with you, but just so we can perhaps rule out some things or clarify this stage, what is, in terms of disability, what is the definition or um, under, understanding 
about how that might be um, <clears throat> recorded for a child coming into the secure care facility. Okay, so um, in terms of being recorded for any child coming to the outer home care system, it would generally rely on a diagnosis. Um, in relation to the three young people that have been in the safe care house, one has um, does not have a disability. The other two young people are undergoing assessments, and I think that there's likely likelihood of um, you know mild to moderate intellectual delays or cognitive. Um, disorders, but certainly also functional disabilities in the case of one young person or mental health issues. So, uh, and in terms of the two children that um, there's ongoing uh, assessment, um, you said two of the children were Aboriginal children. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us of those two? Uh, is it one or two of those that are in that category? One. I see. Now, in your answer earlier about um, whether there was disability, you mentioned diagnosis, but you said also NDIS plan. Is there a link between uh, whether a child has an NDIS plan or not and whether they may be recorded as a, a child in care with disability? No. Um not necessarily. If a child, of course, is an NDIS plan, they will be recorded as having a disability. But it's not um, essential because we are often in the stage, of, we're in the stage of um, ha having assessments undertaken for a lot of children in care where we believe they may have a disability. Now, those assessments that you're talking about, and in particular the ones involving uh, the children that have been in the secure care, uh, what what does that involve in terms of assessment? Okay, so it's uh, unique to each child. I can tell you at the moment, for the one young Aboriginal young person in there, um, an uh, FASD assessment is being undertaken um, in relation to um, education, literacy, um, and a range of other um, cognitive functioning um, and cognitive function with that young person. And is that type of assessment done in whilst in the safe care house, either in part or in whole? Yes, if that's appropriate, or they may leave the safe care house to go and have an assessment, depending on the individual circumstances of the young person. Uh, and just so we're not at cross purposes there, I mean during the length of the time that they are um, admitted and within the facility, whether the provider or the practitioner who sees them is off-site or, or comes on-site. Okay, so it can be both. Um, Although it's called a secure care facility, um, secure care is really um, in relation to the young child or young person and the stage they're at, as opposed to this facility in general. So um, as a young person is um, progresses in the facility and depending on their unique circumstances, um, they will regularly leave um, for different reasons, including medical and assessments and outings and family visits or even a holiday and then um, and then progress to a point where they can freely leave the house. So if there was a requirement of concern for safety, the young person or others, um, and then the uh, any assessment or clinical or therapeutic work would be done in the residence, if it was more suitable to do it outside and there weren't those safety and security risks, then we would take the young people out for those um, appointments. But in, in taking them out, I, I take it that they would go with a worker or workers from um, the, the department 
and from the centre to go to wherever they need to go and then they'd be returned back in their company. Yes. Um, and just to follow on with that, in the progression you were talking about, that is there a point where um, the young person may be able to leave voluntarily the, the house unaccompanied and then be trusted to come back? Um, yes, and I, I could probably illustrate it by way of a local example, if that's suitable. Yes. So uh, uh, one young person who came into the, the safe care program start after about six, seven weeks started having um, a lot of outings and they got increasingly regular and we do this with, we've done this with all of the young people. And then as the children reach a point where they feel safe and, um, and confident and we, we progress and the, their behaviour stabilised and regulated, we progress to an area where um, the young people will go out for outings and it could be shopping, it could be going to a nature park, it could be going to the movies, it could be going out to school. Um, and we would be in the area if they required assistance or support and then it reached a point with this young person that in discussion with her care team, she did, it was determined that she could freely come and go from the safe care house um, and that in discussion with her, she set curfews for school nights at 9.30 and Fridays and Saturdays at 11. And there was there's always a, an agreed plan, such as obviously like any parent, we wouldn't want her to be catching you know, public transport late in the evening, so we would drop her off, pick her up, and um, that was, a, you know, a usual arrangement in transitioning her back to reintegration in the community. Now, in that situation, um, to enable the, the child to be able to come and go like that, uh, does the position have to be reached that, the, the child is no longer presenting a risk of harm to themselves or to others so that the department can allow the child to, to leave and come back to the facility unaccompanied like that? Yes. I want to ask you a little bit more about the, the three children that have been in the current um, safe care house. Are you able to tell us what length of stays they had? Yes. Um... One, the first young person has been in there for 15 months, um, is not currently in there because she's in detention. Um, and that's a really, uh, that's a unique situation. Uh, second young person came in in July last year and was ready to leave in um, late March, early April, but we thought she was ready to leave. Um, she didn't feel that she was ready to leave, so then um, she remained for a further month and had a, has had quite an extensive transition to foster care. And the third young person has only been in there a matter of weeks. Right, so the second case that you spoke about there, I take it that's the example earlier of the person who could come and go as part of their yes. transition? Yes. <clears throat> Which is the aim for all of the young people? The aim being that there would be a point reached where there's a transition phase before they end up leaving. Yes. <clears throat> now, I just want to move away from the individual cases, but just still they're relevant to this, to ask you then about um, the the re-commencement um, of the need for the, the secure care house, you mentioned in your statement that it was an imperative um, and that out of the, the situation at that time with the two um, children that were in need, there had to be a, a, a reasonably quick and short time frame to um, commence the operation of of the safe care model and safe care house. Um, yes. Could you just explain ab about that, if you could, please, about why it became such an imperative in mm -hmm. those circumstances? 
Okay, so um, we had two young people with extremely complex um, behaviours. There was a significant risk of safety to both of them, and I mean a risk of um, serious injury or even death, in, in my view, for both young people. And they were, there were no other placement options at all. No other providers would, um, would provide care for them. The, we don't have internal residential care. The, there were no suitable interstate options and that was there would be significant risk in that. And also um, our agency and myself are of the view that these um, young people are in our care and it's our responsibility to, to um, apply all resources and care that we can to ensure that um, they achieve their greatest <coughs> outcomes and... Uh, putting our young people into state in placements, we think is an abrogation of that responsibility. So in terms of doing this, there was no other option, no other feasible and safe option. <clears throat> and at that point, um, what was the time frame over which the the facility, the need was identified and then the facility was operation. The need's been identified on and off for many years, but there's been a lack of will or courage or support for it. I think it got to the point in early April or mid-April 2020 where it was absolutely clear to me that we needed to make a decision to put in place a program for these two young people that would keep them safe. And from that point, I, it was about six weeks to when we commenced. Now, in the six weeks, um, what was the, the process of um, re resuming um, whatever framework needed to be put in place and, and getting that um, established so that the house could commence operating in that time frame. Okay, so there was obviously some additional infrastructure works and furnishing and fittings. There was um, there was the development of the the initial development of the framework and model of care. To support us with that, we recruited a. Uh, a, a, a manager who had been the assistant director for the CAST French um, Secure Care Centre, which um, was a, obviously a great support. And then we have a range of other staff who are really quite experienced in this field. We worked with, um, you know, it was really quite a, a huge team effort, our policy area, our education and training area, our clinical practice and professional services area. We... Um, had consultations um, with our Clinical Professional Practice Governance Committee, who are also really quite um, expert in the area, particularly Dr. Bath. We, the staff spoke with um, Sherwood Health staff on a number of occasions to get advice. And we also did a literature review and largely um, based our decision making on the the report of um, Dr. Kelly, Kelly Thompson. Dr. Thompson. There yeah. was other documentations we looked at, but it was largely on the report of Dr. <laughs> Thompson. We also reviewed the previous material consultations, legislation, and, and it was a very basic framework, um, which would not have been fit for purpose for what we were trying to achieve in a, a trauma-informed model. We'd also done significant work with the ACF to develop a therapeutic residential care model or the intensive therapeutic resident care model that we'd rolled out. So this was an extension of that. Now, the, the two um, young people that gave rise to this, this need to um, bring about the safe care model in operation, they were at the verge of potentially being released from youth detention. 
one was um, and the other was in the safe care house being cared for as a if, as in a gen, general resi care model, which just was not was not helpful or successful at all. Now, you explained in your statement that because of their circumstances, it wasn't possible um, for them, they didn't have a, a residential care placement which they could actually go to, or in the case of the, um, the child that was in the, the house already, I take it you mean a, a residential care placement that could continue. So that young person was in the house and we had um, a range of our own staff and supplementary staff from another care agency or organisation. It was not, there was not a single intensive therapeutic resident care provider who would or could take either young person. Now, as for the, the rationale or the purpose of the facility, uh, in your statement at paragraph 17, this is your first statement, um, you've set out that the purpose is to provide a safe place of care for young people with extremely complex needs uh, and a demonstrated pattern of aggressive, violent or high-risk behaviour, um, which presents a substantial risk of significant harm to themselves or others in circumstances where all other placement types were demonstrated to be unable to meet their needs. Now, that, that part that I've read there, it's, um, it's describing a purpose, but um, I'm not sure if you were listening earlier to the evidence given by Dr Thompson. Were you able to hear that this morning? Yes, I was. Um, you'll recall that I asked Dr Thompson about the purpose of the WA model mm -hmm. um, and she was talking there about from her report that there were different purposes that she'd identified through her study of um, one might be uh, a, an assessment, one might be intervention. It was obviously a detention model which is not completely relevant here at the moment but also um, a therapeutic model. Um, mm -hmm. The purpose of the, of the safe care house in the NT, are you able mm -hmm. to tell us where that sits within those concepts of a model and purpose? Mm -hmm. So um, I guess what I described before is really the imperative. Um, the model would fit, would essentially be an intervention model where um, initially it is about um, intervention, circuit breakers, you've heard mentioned multiple times today, with support and assessment and then therapeutic intervention to transition and reintegrate young people back to the community. Right. Now, there's obviously a, a differences between the model that's being employed in Northern Territory and uh, the Cath French facility that Dr Thompson spoke about today and, and other jurisdictions as well but just at the moment on this question of the, the purpose or the rationale for it, at least one purpose is that same circuit breaker, stabilising of behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, yes. But are you saying that there's also then not just um, therapeutic care being provided, but there may be some other actual therapy that's provided or, or other supports that are actively provided? Yes. And is that a point of distinction to the WA model that we've heard about? I think there's, there's a number of significant distinctions. The purpose is not just for a circuit breaker because I think, as um, Dr Thompson said, it pretty much becomes a revolving door, um, much like... Uh, young people that go to detention, it's not helpful at all. In 21 days, it is very, very challenging to really achieve anything with um, the young people. So it is a therapeutic intervention that does start at day one. It's not like there's, you know, 
circuit breaker stabilization and therapeutic intervention. It's not um, exclusive, mutually exclusive. So in terms of the type of um, therapeutic interventions is it's the relationships with the staff on a daily basis. It's the intensity of the wraparound staff that are there. It, we have a clinical specialist there full time to work with staff to be able to review and assess their practice on a daily basis and how they manage things and how they could do better and identify what may be triggers for the young people, what might support their behaviours. We have um, psychologists that work directly with the young people and under the new model that we're developing with, developing with the Australian Childhood Foundation, that will be a, what we call a 0.6 FTE or about 25 hours a week for the young people in there, direct intervention. We also have things in place around, um, at, we have an elder in residence in our agency who's um, a particularly renowned um, doctor of social work, Dr um, Christine Fijo King, whose expertise is around um, uh, kinship in the between and comparisons between the Larrakia and and Warramunga nations in the Tennant Creek Barclay region. We have uh, each young person who is Aboriginal has an Aboriginal cultural support worker or um, advisor. So, for example, of the 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 one Aboriginal young person in there now, her Aboriginal senior Aboriginal community worker is someone that knows her family very well and has worked with her in the past. So that relationship is ongoing. Um, other aspects of this, I've just, um, we have had equine therapy, dog therapy. Uh, one young person was learning the violin. Another was doing rapping and recording. There is gymnastics. There's what we call the Balanced Choice Program, which is a social emotional wellbeing program around um, exercise and health. Um, the nutritionist comes in when the young people reach a point. They design their menus and cooking with them. Um, we have art lessons. Uh, for example, there's a young woman in there at the moment is doing a cultural mural in there with the art, the art teacher. Um, there's a videography program that is um, working with one, the young woman to develop her her story in, in film. There's also, and I won't say the name of it because it will say what community she comes from, but a specific um, holistic wellbeing and cultural program from her remote community that is coming in and working with her. Then um, on the more clinical type intervention, there's um, the, age, the service that we have on a panel contract that is doing the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder assessment in the three domains of speech, language, con cognition, paediatricians involved and on the care team. Family regularly visit um, all of the young people, uh, even the young one who's interstate. We fly her family over uh, reasonably regularly and have taken her back there for holidays. Um, and then uh, bespoke to one young person's needs in there is a treatment order for um, volatile substance rehabilitate, abuse rehabilitation program. There's um, someone from the a local cultural healing centre that is working with her also. Um, Australian Childhood Foundation, obviously. Um, so these are the range of programs. So there's some that are core, obviously, um, and then there's some that are bespoke and designed um, or requested by the young people who are in there. But they have a full program on a on a daily basis. See now that range of activities and, and supports that you're talking about there, going back to the question that I asked about um, it not being just simply uh, the circuit breaker type of model and purpose those things that you've just explained, I take it, are then moving into the next phase of what might be um, broadly about putting in place the supports and things for the person there, but with a carryover for when they 
when they exit? Um, yes, but when we say phases, some of those programs will start on day two. Sorry, Miss Kerr, can I just ask you to stop there, Chair? I'm sorry, we've got um, planes flying past our window here and we can't hear properly and the interpreters uh, are not able to perform their service. Can we have a short break, please? Yes, we can have a short break until the attack is finished and then we'll resume. Thank you. Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Thank you. I understand that uh, the uh, Air Force or whoever it is has ceased their buzzing activity, so please do resume. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Kerr, did you hear the evidence that was given earlier today by Mr. Espy from Naja? I think you might be on mute, Ms. Kerr, at your end. We'll just see if it's... Yes, thank you. No, we, I can hear you now. Um, again, it's very faint at your end, though, so if you could speak a little louder or adjust the sound, that would be great. Okay. We have the sound on 100%, so I'll try and speak louder. All right. Thank you. Um, one of the points that Mr Espy raised um, earlier on behalf of Naja and by reference to the correspondence, um, which I understand you've seen and been a party to discussions about previously uh, yes. was that there was no consultation with Naja um, during the period when it was determined that there would be the need to have the safe house um, commence and its actual commencement of operation. Um, now, was that the case? There hadn't been consultation with um, Naja in particular or other stakeholders like that in the community sector during that period? In that period, um, I'll have to refer to my statement for the exact dates, but in that period, we did have a meeting with Naja where um, the CEO and others were there and we gave them the framework document, the very first draft, um, and explained what the um, intent was and why what we were doing and what we were trying to achieve. So that did happen. It would have been a meeting of about, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. We also did that with the Children's Commissioner in her office and um, other providers, government providers in particular. I see. And was it then following that meeting and giving the, the draft of the framework document that the correspondence then came from uh, Naja and the NT Legal Aid Commission? Without referring... Um, to the documents, my recollection is that that was a number of, quite a number of months later that that letter came in from both NT Lack and Naja, and at, and in that letter they had said that they hadn't received that document, so um, we provided it again to both along with the operations manual right. and but discussed the concerns. Uh, was there any involvement with those organisations or other similar types of organisations in um, the, the development of the draft framework and the policy that was going to attach the operation of the house? Only that meeting where it was, where it was um, presented to them and they were given that document. The feedback was um, there was no negative feedback and there was concerns about where we're going to progress a, or a legislative framework. Now, the, the legislative framework um, issue, um, mm -hmm. you understand from your dealings with the matter and the correspondence from those um, legal service providers that they raise that as a particular concern that the ab there was an absence of a legislative framework that would underpin the uh, operation and the eligibility and the criteria and other important features of the workings of the safe house. Yes. Now, when the, when the safe house commenced, um, it, it commenced without that legislative backing but with a range of policy um, documents that uh, provide the necessary framework. Yes, that's right. 
Now, what's the situation as at today? Is it still um, policy without legislation? As at, uh, if I could, I could probably elaborate. So we did get a legal opinion from um, the Solicitor General's office with that and the mechanism, governance mechanisms and oversight mechanisms that we put in place, including uh, oversight policies, unfettered access to the Office of the Children's Commissioner, legal services um, and others involved in the, the very big care team. In addition to, we also have a, a, a philosophy of bringing the community in as much as we can, and that's um, indicated by the vast range of service providers that come in and work with young people. We also have an executive oversight committee, a weekly review of any incidents in CCTV um, that's done by the director and below, and, our, and, and a range of things that we feel that has given us comfort that it is um, safe. In addition to that, both young people who were in there were court ordered to be there, one on a suspended sentence and one on bail. However, in saying that, we absolutely agree that there needs to be a legislative framework um, and that's for, you know, long-term protection um, of the program and of the young people. And in so doing that, we, we have a legislative reform program every year. This year, the Safe Care House was originally on the legislative reform program that was um, to be, and drafting commenced to be, um, go before the assembly, the instructions to be improved in March and to be progressed um, for September, October sittings. Um, however, it was determined to defer that to stage two, which was um, the intent to develop a single act. And that was for a number of reasons. One was, is, is the complexity of the model. And as you know, we're still um, working through and trying to do and, and developing with the Australian Childhood Foundation a, a, a bespoke, or I won't say bespoke, but a model that fits with our other care um, framework, but also within the cultural context for our young people. Um, so it, in terms of the model, in terms of the complexity of that, the um, Office of the Children Commissioner has done um, uh, with, with our... Um, invitation and our own monitoring um, visit and we were awaiting the report from that which we've only recently um, received and has just been finalised in the last weeks. So with all of those factors in mind and also the understanding that we absolutely have to do um, a comprehensive consultation around this, um, particularly with our, all of our Aboriginal community orgs, we determined to defer it to the legislative program next um, next year, and um, I received advice this morning from our executive director and strategic services that we have proposed dates for next year, which mirror the dates from this year. Right. Now, in terms of that that process, and we can expect from what you said that on that legislative program, legislation will come into effect at some stage in mm -hmm. next year, 2022. Mm -hmm. But in the yes. meantime, the policy framework remains in place. Yes. Uh, and as between now and then, uh, do we understand you to, to say that there is a consultation process, public consultation is being sought? Um, I don't know the exact um, mechanics in terms of public consultation. There is a legislative um, process. We would yes. absolutely be going out to um, all of the agencies we um, intersect with, all of the government departments, you know, Aboriginal Medical Services, NAJA, NTLAC, the, uh, Children's Commissioner and Discrimination Commissioner. We go to um, all of those bodies. Yes. And and what about to what about to um, uh, Aboriginal community um, leaders and and organisations in um, remote re regional areas? Will they be consulted? Okay, so when I talk about the uh, um, Aboriginal community control orgs that we work with, all of our family support grants and all of our Aboriginal carer services and family finding grants all of our youth diversion and youth program grants and contracts 
are all with Aboriginal community controlled orgs um, across the territory. We probably have about 20 ACOs that we have um, contracts and programs with. So there, that is the group. And that encompasses um, most, pretty much all of the communities in the Territory. And what about from the, um, the disability um, sector and, and specialist advice with respect to um, children who have complex disability needs? Um, is that part of the process and who, who is involved in the consultation there? Okay, so that is something that we could coordinate through our Office of Disability um, and, and taking the broad definition of disability, I completely understand that that would be necessary, but this is not a placement where we would have children with um, significant intellectual disabilities or even moderate intellectual disabilities or physical disabilities. That's a, this is a completely different um, care model. Well, I'm, uh, I'm not yeah. sure I understand about that, Ms Kerr. Um, wh what is different um, and what do you um, mean by there wouldn't be children there with that sort of complex disability? Physical and intellectual disabilities? Yeah, so children with physical and intellectual disabilities, mm -hmm. um, where would they be placed if there is a if there's a, a need or satisfaction of the criteria for um, the safe house model? Uh, look, I guess that um, if if that was the case. Um, in the, if there was a young person with a very complex physical intellectual disability and all of the other criteria um, applied, I, I guess it's an option, yes, but, um, you know, we're more than happy to consult on it. There's not an issue there. But No, but I just, sorry, Ms. Kerr, I just don't understand where, where what would be the placement option for those children. Well, um, for example, there are some, a number of children with uh, complex disabilities, physical and intellectual disabilities who are in Ada Home Care who have disability placements with specialist disability service providers. We also manage the voluntary out of home care um, program, which only has three young people in it. Um, and the vast majority are supported with family. Okay, so one one point of distinction that you might be raising with me, Ms Kerr, is complex disability needs. Um, who determines or makes the assessment as to whether um, a child with disability needs might fall into the category of complex or not and need to be cared for somewhere else other than what might otherwise put them into the safe house? I'm not really sure that I understand your question. I mean, with the vast range of young people that we have in the diversity and the range of disabilities, I'm not sure I could pinpoint a, a particular, um, you know, situation. For example, if we had a young person who had dysregulated behaviours but they had serious medical issues and um, disabilities that raised medical issues, they would be in a disability specific disability placement. If it is functional and psychosocial, then yes, the, so the safe care house would be, if it was the last resort, the most appropriate arrangement. But each young person that would need a placement will be assessed um, as an individual. Yes, I see. So functional and psychosocial um, disability, uh, a child who's presenting with the behaviours and the dysregulation that might make them eligible to and, and necessary from territory families' viewpoint to put them into a secure care, they could enter into the safe care house. And if their behaviour is so extreme that their safety and their life and well-being, oh, not their well-being, but their 
their life and safety is at risk or others are at risk, then yes, that would be eligible. Now, Ms. Kerr, one of the points that was raised by um, Mr. Espy about, on behalf of NADRA, about the, the absence of a legislative framework at the moment is about the, the eligibility criteria not being um, precise or not being um, within the legislation so that there can be appropriate oversight or application by, for example, a court body. Um, is, is it, in your view, necessary that there be that type of legislative enshrining of the eligibility criteria? Yes. But in and saying that, there is the same oversights now as if they were in legislation. Including court or judicial officer oversight of who determines? Of, of those young people that are in there, yes. Yeah, but those young people, are you saying that because the, the children who have been there have been on a court order requiring them to, to be there as part of a condition of some other order that flows from um, the justice system? Um, two of them, yes, and the third one's on a treatment order. Okay, so two of them have either been there as part of a, a suspended sentence or a, or a bail order. Is that the situation? Yes. And the other one is a health issue yes. with a treatment order. Yes. Um, and at the moment, the, the courts are able to include those uh, arrangements or a condition as a bail, bail order or a suspended sentence order, a condition for residence at um, the safe house. Only if the young person meets the eligibility criteria and there are no other options. And is that something that the, the Department of Territory Families informs the court about, about whether they meet the criteria? Yes. And is it something that the department has to provide evidence of or to um, make a submission that it should be accepted that they meet that criteria? Well, the Children's Court of the Youth Court needs to accept that. We regularly get... Um, recommendations or requests from the courts for young people to be placed in the safe care house and it's more often that we make submissions why they shouldn't be because they are not they don't fit the eligibility criteria but going yeah. back to the question i absolutely agree there needs to be a legislative framework now can i just take you to the framework at present as i understand it, and i want to ask you about this in your uh, statement of paragraph 68, sorry, 65, um, you've, you've written that the eligibility criteria is set out at page five of the safe care framework and you've referred to one of the annexes to your statement. I'm sorry, which statement? I, which, this, is, statement? Um, this is the statement which is your 9 June 2021 statement. Yes, okay. You have that? Yes. I was referring you to paragraph 65 there about the eligibility criteria set out in the safe care framework. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the policy document which provides the rule for whether a child is eligible or not. Yes. And that's what the department applies in making that determination. Yes. Now, can I ask you, please, if we could, um, we'll try and bring the document up on the screen. Could we please, I think it's at tab 66 of the tender bundle and the reference is NTT. Point zero 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 two point zero 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 seven point zero zero one zero. Uh, can you see that, Ms. Kerr? Yeah. That's the framework document we're talking about? Yes. And this is 
a draft of this document is the document that was provided to NARJA and um, the NT Legal Aid Commission in that yes. process you spoke about earlier? Yes. Now, could we go to page five, please? Page five at point three, eligibility criteria. And could we just zoom in on that? Thanks. Um, you'll see it's, it has the details there of the criteria yes. as to when the child is, is um, to be placed there. Um, it's limited to, and there's an age range, 12 to 17, under the yes. protection order or a long or short-term direction with responsibility vested in the, the chief executive officer. And the second point is when there is a substantial risk of significant harm to the child. Yes. And the third point, the risk to the child cannot be managed or reduced by any other available care option. Yes. Um, and then the further part of the policy provides, in order for the placement to be approved, these things must be demonstrated. And one, the placement is in the best child's best interests. And two, all yes. other placement options have been exhausted no other available support or placement deemed adequate to protect the child from significant harm. Yes. And it's only in those circumstances then that um, the, the placement into the safe care house would be um, acceptable. Yes. Now, can I just raise something with you about that? Could we go... We could leave that on the screen, but can I... Um, ask you about in your statement, if you can go to paragraph 17, where you've referred to um, the criteria or when a child might be placed into the safe care house. And one of the things that you've said in there is that um, where the child is for young people with extremely complex needs and demonstrated pattern of aggressive, vulnerable, high risk behaviour, which presents a substantial risk of significant harm to themselves or others. Now, yes. if we look at the policy though, the eligibility criteria on the framework document, um, it says a substantial risk of significant harm to the child. Yes. It doesn't say a child or others. And if you read on, it talks about the demonstrated risks um, and the serious demonstrated risks they pose to themselves through self-harm, suicidal ideation and their vulnerability to abuse by others. And Sorry, and, sorry Ms. Kerr, where are you reading from now? 17A. Yes, or your statement, 17A. Yeah. Yes. Yes, but what I'm drawing to your attention is that in the eligibility criteria in the policy document, it mm -hmm. seems to say only the criteria is risk of harm to the child, not yes. significant risk of harm to others. Yes. And then in the elaboration in the statement, it talks about... No, I'm not asking about the statement, no, Ms. Kerr, I'm asking about the policy document. Yes, the policy document is accurate. So the, the, so the criteria is only if there's a significant risk of harm to the child and those other points that we see at point three on the screen. Yes. yes. So, and others, is that wrong? That's not part of the eligibility criteria. Well, not in that document, no, and that... If there but was that is only... the, that's the policy document. Oh, sorry, let, let, please let Ms Kerr complete her answer, if you don't mind. Yes, Ms Kerr. Thank you. If there was only harm to others, they would not be eligible. Okay. So if does it have to be then, are you saying there has to be harm to the child as per what we see in the criteria on the screen on at point three of the policy document. Yes. 
Um, and if unless there's harm to themselves, if it's only or others, they wouldn't qualify. No. But they might if it's if it's if it's to themselves and others. Yes. And if you look at your statement where it says in paragraph seventeen, or others, that that part's not right then. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's not right, but I'm not actually saying that's the eligibility criteria. I think that's more of a holistic statement that's giving explanation to it. But I'm, I'm happy to accept that it is not right that someone would go to safe care if they pose a risk of harm to others. I see. And Fine. J just on this issue about the eligibility criteria, um, mm -hmm. would you accept this, Ms Kerr, that this is, this is one example perhaps of why enshrining in legislation the eligibility criteria is important so that there is precision and, and, and accountability as to what in fact are the things that have to be satisfied? Absolutely, agree. Um, can I ask you, while we've got the policy document on the screen, can we go then please to point four, which commences on the same page that we have? Yes. About the duration of the placement. Yes. Um, now, again, the, the policy says that it will be a minimum, a three-month minimum length of stay. Mm -hmm. um, but... Is it the case that there's no uh, prescribed position as to what would be the maximum limit on a stay? Yes. And it's a it'll be a case by case basis. I take it. Yes. Um, Taking into account the least restrictive um, options for the young person, um, and I go back to my example. We felt that that young person was well and truly ready to leave um, a couple of months before she felt she was ready to leave. So um, when we say duration, at that point in her journey, she's although she's in a, a, a residence that's used as a secure care facility, she wasn't in a secure care facility as such. She was freely able to come and go. Does that mean that the, the, the house by that stage is no longer treated as being the safe house in a secure care sense? It, it very well could be for the other young person in there, and which but, was but, the case. Please do, do finish your answer, Ms. Kerr. Yeah, so one young person can come and go. They can go into the kitchen and access, um, you know, implements, knives, cooking, boiling water. Um, and um, essentially live freely within the house and the other cannot go into the kitchen because there's high risk in her doing that. I see. And the other one cannot freely leave the residence because of the risk of that. So, yes, the residence can be locked and, yes, there's security and, yes, there's CCTV, However, if the security um, aspect of it is around the young individual young person or the restrictions on liberty around the individual young person as opposed to everyone in the residence all the time. Now, in that example that you've just given and, and come back to, um, the young girl who's able to come and go, she would no longer meet the eligibility criteria in the policy. The eligibility criteria for entry, um, no. However, and I think it it's, um, was raised at some length by um, Dr Thompson, there has to be a transition plan to help ensure success on the other side. If the young person's not comfortable, ready or feeling confident enough and may have anxiety about leaving or feels that they need to stay to progress their education, um, finish a qualification, 
find the right placement, uh, et cetera, then uh, I think that's the intent of the program. Yes, not eligible for secure care, and yes, secure care wouldn't be necessary for her any longer. But it doesn't mean that she can't continue to reside in the residence. No, and that, that's what I was exploring with you earlier. The residence might then in part be seen as simply residential, non-secure care for that child. Yes. Without any restraints or restrictions of the kind that would operate for secure care. Yes. Now, just coming back to the, the policy document, please, and the duration of the placement. <clears throat> um, the three-month minimum stay, um, are you able to, to help us with why three months was identified as being the minimum period and what was hoped to be achieved in the three months? Yeah. So um, in identifying that for, you know, the initial drafting and setup, we were largely informed by the work of Dr. Thompson. Uh, and that's what yeah. recommended in her work. It's also informed, I think, by the, well, I was informed by the experience of the staff that have worked for decades in um, residential care and secure care who were developing and working on the model. All right. And, and the purpose then for having that minimum period of three months? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we can accept circuit breaker for part of that? is one of the purposes for within that minimum stay. But then what, what else is the three-month period designed to achieve as a minimum? So when I say circuit breaker, it's bringing a young person in who's had very extreme dangerous behaviours. Um, it's not a circuit breaker in the sense of the other models where there's 21 days and the hope is to... Um, you know, bring young people in, detox, try and do a medical assessment and sort out medication and that. It's, um, it's the point where we can start doing a therapeutic invention, intervention. And in less than three months, the advice and recommendations were that you really couldn't achieve anything. So it involves stability, support, assessment, and then... Um, a, a transition plan, which really starts pretty much when you're in. The, the, there's got to be an absolute outcome. Um, so it starts when they're in. So it's really clearly explained that at different milestones, which are undertaken with the young person and the care team, there will be levels of progress and um, exiting the safe care house, going to school, etc. Does that make sense, I think? Uh, it makes sense. Mr Crowley, uh, you may remember that uh, Dr Webster seemed to give uh, <coughs> some support to uh, a concept such as this at uh, page 174 of the transcript on day two. <coughs> now, um, can we take now, that Matt, one? Mr. Mr Crowley, what other issues have we to explore here? Because to some extent, uh, one gets the feeling that uh, we're going over ground that uh, one way or another we've covered previously. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure um, about that, Chair, but um, I will just have a look to see what else there was because there was um, quite a few other points that were specific to the evidence in the NT jurisdiction. Um, and I was about to go to follow up the transition um, pathway with the witness. Is this something that is done? Since there have only been three children who have been in care in this facility, are we doing any more than looking at the published criteria, whether in a policy document or some other document? I'm, I'm just, I have to say, I'm just not sure what this is adding to uh, what we've already um, explored. Well, one, one thing that may assist with that, Chair, is that um, the, the Territory is looking at legislative um, uh, introduction of what the model would be, and at the moment with the policy materials that we have and the matters that we're exploring, um, these are matters that we would 
seek to identify about what may happen and what might be in the legislative model and whether... I'm not sure how we can look at what might be in the... Do you mean that uh, we're exploring what uh, recommendations the Royal Commission may make for legislation? Is that what you're saying? No. What I'm saying, what? Chair, is that when we're considering the risk of violence, abuse, neglect, exploitation for First Nations children with disability who might come into this facility, notwithstanding there's only been three children to date, but might in the future, that's an issue which, in my submission, is a matter within the terms of reference for the Commission that the Commission would have an interest in knowing about what's planned and what the, what the Territory is going to do and how it incorporates these things in its legislative model. I'm not sure that Ms Kerr is going to be able to help us with what's planned. Ms Kerr has agreed that legislation is a good idea. Yes. I, don't know, I don't know that Ms Kerr will be drafting the legislation or giving instructions to Parliamentary Council to do so. Am I right, Ms Kerr? Yes, sir. We will uh, certainly have uh, an opinion and a perspective, but um, I won't be giving those instructions. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr Crowley, if you can do this very briefly, because um, I would like today to finish at four. There are certain things that uh, need to be done uh, today, um, and I'd rather not to have this uh, continue beyond that time. So if you would bear that in mind, please, so that we can finish. Yes, absolutely. Just pardon me. Just pardon me, um, Ms Kerr and Chair. Um, could I just perhaps bring up the other document that was earlier tended with your statement, Ms Kerr? Could we go please to the document uh, NTT.0002.0073 Is that the operations manual? Yes. Uh, now, as it says, it's the operations manual for the, the safe care program in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask you, as I mentioned about the, the transition and um, what might be done about that or how that is to operate, um, this document may not be the, the complete answer of it, but I wanted to bring your attention to it and perhaps from there, if you could outline for us what is planned and how things are being done. Uh, if we could go to page 14 of the document at point 12. Uh, there's a, a point 12 of the, the operation uh, manual, which identifies therapeutic plans, um, says it's a core strategy um, to develop those individual therapeutic plans. But then has a, a note that it's being, um, the model is currently being developed. Um, are you able to help us with that? What is the model at the moment? What is being developed and what the idea is of the um, individual therapeutic plans, how that will will look. Okay, so the individual therapeutic plan is quite different to the care plan that every young person um, in care has, which also includes a, um, a cultural care plan and the behaviour support plan for their daily, um, their daily um supports of behaviours for them and staff in, in, the, in the residence. The individual therapeutic plan is the one that will come out of the work that we're doing with Australian Childhood Foundation, which is the further development of a model. So this morning, Dr Thompson talked about the various models that Kibble and Sanctuary and various models that people have used. But they, we, we, and well, true. We have felt that they're not sufficiently um, 
suitable for the Northern Territory or our children and perhaps not um, detailed enough. So that's why we've gone to the Australian Centre for um, Excellence in terms of Resi Care and the Australian Childhood Foundation to develop a model which in that will have individual therapeutic plans for young people. So um, that's, where is that at the moment? That's in, in development? Yeah. The proposal so has been prepared? The proposal's prepared, procurement's been finalised and it's in development and the, it's certainly parts have commenced the next induction program for staff, which will be three weeks run with us and ACF, will be um, rolling out most of that work. And in terms of a transition or what we've heard about a step down from the secure care um, setting, mm. is this plan intended to... Um, bridge both what commences in the facility and then what continues after leaving the safe house? Um, look, it, it may very well, but the young person's care plan is the enduring document that goes with them. And as to what um, is the, the way in which that transition occurs at the moment, um, could you just tell us about that, what, what is the position at the moment as to making that step down? So the um, obviously the transition is mapped out uh, with the young person and the care team and I can talk in relation to two young people who have transition plans which are really very, very different to each other but one is continuing education um, finalising getting her driver's licence. She's gone into a foster care placement. She's um, gained employment and she doesn't have any, in the clinical sense, any ongoing therapeutic supports. She, is, um, she has regular case management support and support to do a range of social um and other wellbeing activities, and that's the point where she's got to now. Her plan actually extends out um, to she's 21 at this point. So her placement, there's already agreement for it to be extended with her foster carer well, well beyond 18, and she is, there's a plan for her coming into employment, and she's finalising a Cert 3 in childcare and carer services in a matter of weeks. So her plan is not an individual therapeutic plan, it's a transition to independent living plan. Yes. It may be that for the other young person, her, her transition plan is really, really quite different because her family's interstate and our, our very, very strong intent is for her to go to a placement in that jurisdiction near her family with all of the psychiatric, psychological, social, emotional wellbeing support she needs over there. And her plan will be transferred with her to that jurisdiction. Um, yes, thank you, Ms Kerr. Can I just raise something following the point the Chair raised earlier about some evidence that was given earlier about Dr Webster from Janela Dilba? Um, I'm not sure if you were across that evidence, but um, one of the points that he'd raised earlier in, in the week was about um, Janela Dilba um, wanting to be involved in the delivery of comprehensive primary health care to support children in the safe care house, and that Janela Dilba um, had been trying to engage or wanting to engage with the department to be involved with that. Um, is that something which... Um, you, you understand or have any knowledge about at the moment what may be happening to incorporate that or willingness to incorporate that? Yes, we have no intention of incorporating that as an extension of what they provide in detention to the safe care house. All of the young people in safe care have their own paediatricians and their own medical and other plans. 
Um, just pardon me. Pardon me, Chair. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you, um, Ms. Kerr. Those are the questions that I'll ask. Um, Chair, I, I um, will leave any time for further questions if, uh, Chair, you have questions or the other commissioners may have questions to complete the evidence of Ms. Kerr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Crowley. Uh, Commissioner Mason, do you have any questions of Ms. Kerr? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Kerr, for your evidence today. Um, and also thank you for your service in the Northern Territory to, to children and families. Um, I was really, really interested in Dr. Thompson's evidence this morning and um, about the work that she did through the Churchill Foundation and the document that she created. And uh, a couple of things stood out for me. Um, as you know, uh, we have a long history in this country in relation to uh, children being removed from families and being in previously called welfare systems now out of home care systems. Yeah. And uh, I was interested to see in the document that she had uh, created um, as a result of fellowship, uh, just uh, looking at uh, children with complex developmental trauma. Uh, and she says in her, in her notes, require high levels of care and support in order to heal. Um, yes. And current systems in place are not able to effectively address the underlying trauma um, and uh, as you know, during my time at MPY Women's Council, uh, discussion of trauma um, has been quite a significant area of development in terms of uh, Aboriginal people from the Ngāvarapitja Yankul Jara region understanding what that trauma means. It's a word, it's an English word that can't be translated um, into another language. The other word that can't be translated into another language easily is the word hope. Um, and these two words really coincide because um, what I understood around trauma, the antidote to trauma is hope. Um, and so she, she goes in further. Uh, in uh, Commissioner Mason, do you have a question for Ms Kerr? I do. I think, yes, okay. I do. Let's uh, get talking there. About, <laughs> I think it, um, talking about transition out of um, the care system and uh, and the um, outcomes that she was talking about in the Western Australian uh, facility using an outcome of, uh, of uh, measuring hope for the child. I'm just interested, uh, Ms Kerr, with all of the work that you do there in out-of-home care in the Territory, around the language of using not just trauma, because that, that's very well used in the system, but the word of hope in the way that it's described within the system, within documents, mm -hmm. within um, uh, the different stages, life course stages of a, of a child and family interacting with the out-of-home care system. Is that is that a term that is often used in the Territory in that context of out-of-home care, and particularly we're talking about secure care? Um, no, we tend to use um, success um, well-being um, connection and belonging, so um, and and achieving. So those are the sort of the the outcome words that we talk about, and it's very much um, the outcome measures that, in terms of success for us, is reconnection to family and culture, and achieving success. And whether it's in the rapping or the music or the education or being able to go and live back with family or go and live with foster carers. So there's, it's for us it's about success and we have high expectations for our, our young people, um, often young people that, you know, if you, if you allow people to say it, well, people will think they have no hope or no chance for the future. But, but we don't believe that. And, and I know we've only had three young people at the moment but we're very, um, very chuffed and very pleased and proud of them with what they've achieved in the time we've had them. 
Yeah, your description of the uh, one of the young people coming out and her having control of that transition does, in very many ways, describes ho describe hope to me in that regard. Thank, thank you very much for, for your evidence today. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Commissioner Galbally, do you have any questions of Ms Kerr? <laughs> yes, thank you, Ms Kerr. Um, so you, I think you estimated about 48 um, young people are in resi care out of the 962. Anyway, something around that. I wondered how many of those are First Nations. And you don't need to answer that now, um, but I'd like to get that figure. You may have it now. Um, and then secondly, it was how many of those young people um, end up in juvenile justice. Um, so I'd like to know that. And I've, I've got another area I'd like to ask questions about too. But you might want to take those on notice. I don't know. I can, um, I, of the 48 young people in out-of-home care, about 40 of them would be Aboriginal um, children of, uh, in ITRC. Uh, <laughs> of the total number of 962 children in out-of-home care, 87% are Aboriginal. We have obviously the proportion, the highest number of, um, uh, not number, but the highest percentage of total out of home care um, children as Aboriginal, but we also have the lowest proportion of our Aboriginal population in out of home care in the country. Um, in terms of young people in detention from out of home care, today there's 51 people in, young people in detention, nine have out of home care. Um, orders, and of the 962-odd children in out-of-home care, only 1% over the last three years have gone to detention. Thank you. It's that fallacy that all children in detention are from out-of-home care and all out-of-home care children have a trajectory to detention is just not the case. We have as many kids going to university or more than we have going to detention. Thank you. Now, you have responsibility for disability programs. You didn't add those to your list, but I presumed you had, But because you've got everything else. <laughs> um, not quite. Um, we have a community sector that has the Office of Disability, which is the Strategic Policy and Universal Programs. Um, what I have in my family's area is a disability development team that we've developed um, of fantastically... Uh, a qualified, passionate people who work with our children now at home care to assess, support their um, their development needs and to support um, them getting robust NDIS plans. So I was asked, I was wanting to inquire about the numbers of young people under 18 who are in a, another form of out of home care, which is disability placement. And how many of those would be First Nations too? Okay. Well, we have three young people in voluntary out-of-home care in the Territory. Um, all of the others that aren't with us or are, are with parents. I, I um, meant people with intellectual disability or, or cerebral palsy or whatever. Yes. So um, in turn, I, I can... I think in terms of children in out-of-home care with the agency, I would have to find the exact number, but my my thinking is it's around the 20, 25. However, their children have been taken into care that um, of the CEO as opposed to we also um, coordinate and support families with children in voluntary out-of-home care where... We pay board, lodging, accommodation, etc., and the NDIS pays for services. Thank and you. they are not aware of the CA. Parental responsibilities remains with their parents. Thank you. Since we're into statistics, how many Aboriginal children under the age of 18 are there in the Territory? Um, about 60,000. 
So what it's the, ni the 962 uh, represents something like, uh, uh, what, 1.4%? Sorry? One in yeah. 60. One in 60, yeah. Okay. How does that compare with the other ab uh, Aboriginal populations in the other states and territories? You said this is the lowest. It's the lowest. We're Do you know what it is elsewhere? Do you know what it else is elsewhere? Not exactly. Sorry, right. we'll we'll use our okay. vast resources to find out. Excellent. Oh, Commissioner, oh. I can also tell you we're the only jurisdiction that's had a reduction in children in out of home care for the last four years in a row. What about the last six years in a row? I've only been here. Doing the reform for four years, Commissioner. <laughs> it was going up at a rate of 10% every year since yeah. counting started pretty much. Very good. All right, thank you. Um, again, yeah. I, I assume that uh, there are no Excuse questions. me, Chair, sorry to interrupt. I, there was one matter that I'd neglected to ask earlier that had been raised with me by Council for the uh, Territory. Yeah. I wanted to deal with that before Ms Kerr is um, excused. Yes, go ahead. Um, Ms Kerr, earlier today when Mr Espy gave some evidence, you uh, would have heard him speak about um, what he understood was a case where a Naja client um, had, uh, had not been able to get into the safe house uh, but instead ended up in the detention centre. Uh, you're familiar with that case, aren't you? Yes. Now, um, as I understand it, the position was that that was as part of a bail um, application, there was a, a condition sought that the um, young person might be able to go to the safe house, but this was an instance where he didn't meet the eligibility criteria, so he wasn't able to be accepted into the safe house. Yes. Yes, thank you. That's the only questions I had. Thank you, Chair. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Ms Chambers, I take it you don't have any questions uh, to put to Ms Kerr? Chair. Sorry. All right, thank That's you. Correct, All right, thank Chair. you. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. We seem to have some uh, echoing of uh, substantial proportions, but uh, thank you very much, Ms. Kerr, for coming to the Royal Commission and giving your evidence, and also for the uh, detailed statement that uh, you provided. We appreciate the, the assistance that you have given. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Now, uh, Mr Crowley, perhaps you could let us know what happens tomorrow. I should say that as I look out the window in Sydney, it looks a bit like Los Angeles in the mid-1970s, presumably because they're burning off. So we've had earthquakes, we've had attacks by helicopters, we've got massive air pollution. I wonder what else will happen. Well, it's not on my schedule for tomorrow, Chair, to predict, but um, I can tell you what is planned for tomorrow. Um, we have tomorrow um, uh, Catherine Little and Paul Gray, uh, representatives from Snake and uh, the Family Matters campaign collectively, to give some evidence. Uh, on will on be, what will be what will be their topic? They will be speaking about a range of matters, including um, the need for data, um, models for um, community controlled or community delivered services and supports for. Uh, families and children with disability in the out-of-home care system uh, and from a national perspective from their respective positions as um, Peak Body and the Family Matters Campaign representatives. We will also have um, uh, some pre-recorded evidence which we uh, were not able to get to earlier in the week, uh, which was the, the case study of um, Maggie, uh, which will be played to the Commission. And following that, uh, Chair, there will then be um, some procedural matters of attending to the residual tender of materials, and then that will bring the proceedings to a close with the, uh, the address uh, from myself as Council Assisting, and then, um, Chair, uh, final closing of this week's hearing uh, by yourself, Chair. Good. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr Crowley. Um, we will then adjourn now and resume at 10am uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time tomorrow, which will be the sixth and final day of this public hearing 16.
the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is adjourned.